from the fading embers of colonialism. Their activism, dedication, and leadership gave life to the belief in Nigeria as a sovereign and independent nation. Let us, at this very moment, affirm that as Nigerians, we are all endowed with the sacred right and individual gifts that God has bestowed on us as a nation and as human beings. No one is greater or lesser than the other. The triumph that Nigeria has achieved shall define us. The travails we have endured shall strengthen us, and no other nation or power on this earth shall keep us from our rightful place and destiny. This nation belongs to you, dear people. Love and cherish it as your very own. Nigeria is yours. Nigeria is remarkable in its formation and essential character. We are a broad and dynamic blend of ethnic groups, religious, tradition, and cultures. Yet, our bonds are yet intangible, strong, invisible, yet universal. We are joined by a common thirst for peace and progress, by the common dream of our prosperity and harmony, and by the unified ideas of tolerance and justice, forging a nation based on the fair application of these noble principles to a diverse population has been a task of significant blessing, but also serious challenge. Some people have said an independent Nigerian should never have come into existence. Some have said that our country will be torn apart. They are forever mistaken. Here, our nation stands, and here we shall remain. This year, we passed a significant milestone in our journey to a better Nigeria by democratically electing a seventh consecutive civilian government. Nigeria has proven that commitment to democracy and the rule of law remains our guiding light. At my inauguration, I made important promises about how I will govern this nation. Among those promises were pledges to reshape and modernize our economy and to secure the lives, liberty, and property of the people. I said that bold reforms were necessary to place our nation on the path of prosperity and growth. On that occasion, I announced the end of the fuel subsidy. I am attuned to the hardship that have come. I have a heart that feels and eyes that see. I wish to explain to you why we must endure this trying moment. Those who sought to perpetuate the fuel subsidy and broken foreign exchange policies are people who will build their family mansion in the middle of a swamp. I am different. I'm not a man to erect our national home on the foundation of mud. To endure, our home must be constructed on safe and pleasant ground. Reform may be painful, but it is what greatness and the future require. We now carry the course of reaching a future Nigeria where the abundance and fruit of the nation are fairly shared among all, not hoarded by a select and greedy few. In Nigeria, where hunger, poverty, 
and hardship are pushed into the shadows and ever-fading past. There is no joy in seeing the people of this nation shoulder burdens that should have been shed years ago. I wish today's difficulties did not exist, but we must endure if we have to reach the good side of our future. My government is doing all that it can do to ease the load. I will now outline the path we are taking to relieve the stress on our families and households. We have embarked on a several sector reform to stabilize the economy, direct physical and monetary policy to fight inflation, encourage production, ensure the security of lives and property, and lend more support to the poor and the vulnerable. Based upon our talks with labor, business, and other stakeholders, we are introducing a provisional wage award increment to enhance the federal minimum wage without causing undue inflation. For the next six months, the average low-grade worker shall receive an additional 25,000 Naira per month. To ensure better grassroots development, we set up an infrastructure support fund for states to invest in critical areas, states have already received funds to provide relief packages against the impact of rising food and other prices, making the economy more robust by lowering transport costs shall be key. In this regard, we have opened a new chapter in public transportation through the development of cheaper, safer, comprehensive natural gas, CNG, buses across the nation. These buses will operate at a fraction of current fuel prices, positively affecting transport fare. The new CNG conversion scheme will start coming in very soon as all hands are on deck to fast track the usual lengthy procurement process. We are also setting up training facilities and workshops across the nation to train and provide new opportunities for the transport operators and entrepreneurs. This is a groundbreaking moment where, as a nation, we embrace more efficient means to power our economy. In making this change, we also make history. I pledged a thorough house cleaning of the den of malvisions the CBN has become. That house cleaning is well underway. A new leadership for the central bank has been constituted. Also, the special investigator will soon present its findings on the past lapses and how to prevent similar recurrences. Henceforth, monetary policy shall be for the benefit of all and not the exclusive province of the powerful and wealthy. Wise tax policy is essential for the economic fairness and development. I have inaugurated a committee on tax reform to improve the efficiency of tax administration in the country and address physical policies that are unfair or hinder the business environment and slow our growth. To boost employment and urban incomes, we are providing investment funding for enterprises with greater potential. Similarly, we are increasing investment in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Commencing this month, the social safety net is being extended through the expansion of the cash transfer 
programs to an additional 15 million vulnerable households. My administration shall always accord the highest priority to the safety of the people, inter-service collaboration, and intelligence sharing have been enhanced. Our service chiefs have been tasked with the vital responsibility of rebuilding the capacity of our security services. Here, I salute and commend our gallant security forces for keeping us safe and securing our territorial integrity. Many have paid the ultimate sacrifice. We remember them today and their families. We shall equip our forces with the ways and means needed to perform their urgent task on behalf of the people. We shall continue to make key appointments in line with the provision of constitution and with fairness towards all men, women, youth, and physically challenged shall continue to be given due regard in these appointments. May I take this opportunity to congratulate the National Assembly for its role in the quick takeoff of this administration through the performance of its constitutional duties of confirmation and oversight. I similarly congratulate the judiciary as a pillar of democracy and fairness. I also thank members of our dynamic civil society organizations and labor unions for their dedication to Nigerian democracy. We may not always agree, but I value your advice and recommendations. You are my brothers and sisters, and you have my due respect. Fellow compatriots, the journey ahead will not be navigated by the fear or hatred. We can only achieve our better Nigeria through courage, compassion, commitment as one indivisible unit. I promise that I shall remain committed and serve faithfully. I also invite all to join this enterprise to make our beloved nation into its better self. We can do it. We must do it. We shall do it. I wish you all a happy 63rd Independence Anniversary. Thank you very much for listening. May God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria and bless all of you. Welcome back. We just had the president's speech, and he started out from way back there where he did the inauguration speech. This is a Channel TV special, independent special, with a theme empowering tomorrow, a new vision for Nigeria at 63. Now, the president, President Bola Tinubu, spoke about a lot of things there, talking about when he made those promises at his inauguration, and the things he said, he, he called them important promises about how he will govern this nation and says among them to reshape and modernize the economy to secure lives liberty and property of the people and so it was very brief it was about 15 minutes perhaps the shortest speech he's delivered he's delivered four from may 29th to the june 12 address to the july 31st address and now this his very first independence day mm. address as brief as it was, I think the question would be, does it answer a lot of things? Yes, one of the things a lot of people looked forward to was the minimum wage announcement, even though, interestingly, that was debunked by the Ministry of Labor, that the president had no plans. Well, he, didn't, he didn't do anything. That was minimum wage. That was what? That wasn't minimum wage. Minimum wage is a law. But hold on, with all the questions that we have, we have... Adjustments, I believe. Well, the, the minimum wage, 
will be looked at. And that law will come to, I mean, when they're ready, we'll get to that point. But for now, you talked about somewhat extra. of a relief, but it's something let's, extra, about twenty-five. Let's allow our guests uh, to come in and tell us more about this. We have here in our Abuja studio, Professor Jido Fuadibi, a lecturer at the National State University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And in our Lagos studio, we have Adeni Kuno, a lecturer at the Lagos State University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And joining us from Greece is a senior advocate of Nigeria, Professor Joy Ezilo. Glad to be here. Thank you. It's good to know that from all over the world we can have Nigerians listening on the president's speech. So let's start off with you, as I say, ladies first. Oh, yes. Uh, before we bring in Professor Ezilo, we have in our Meiduguri studio, Professor Khalifa Dikwa, who's a dean, Borno Elders Forum. Thank you for joining us, Prof. Independence Day. Thank you. And happy Independence Day to you, too. Well, let's start off with the lady in okay. Greece, Professor Ezilo. You heard the president and where he started from. Um, my colleague here asked a question. Did the president's speech, the much you could hear, did it answer the bulk of the questions that many Nigerians have? Yeah, I would say a good speech, uh, somewhat compassionate, uh, but whether it answers the question, especially the yearnings uh, and aspirations of Nigeria, uh, that, that is debatable. And uh, I think uh, it, it strike a chord on a number of uh, uh, issues and uh, demonstrate a little bit of uh, you know, responsive and having a compassionate leader and a, a big departure, a radical departure somehow from a previous speech we've had in the past. But at the same time, uh, I'm sure, like you said, it's very short. Uh, it dealt with different issues, CBN tax reforms, uh, lifting people out of poverty, for securing lives and property. But there are things some Nigerians even like me, we'd be expecting to hear that they didn't hear. Because besides, uh, of course, appointment is going to be very uh, fair to people, uh, talking about uh, hatred and, and promising and, and recommitting uh, to serving us uh, faithfully. Those are very good. Uh, I, I will commend that. I talked about intelligent uh, sharing. And some would say some of the things also uh, we need also to be spared because it's assumed that a uh, government is uh, one entity and intelligence will be shared. And in a, in a, in a speech of, um, of, of this national importance, it might not be exactly uh, what we want to hear uh, uh, but, uh, in terms of uh, doing the need for, because that should be assumed you know, as part of irregularities. He went on also to thank National Assembly uh, for facilitating uh, uh, takeoff of his government. I said he covered, he covered a lot of grounds. Uh, I would say you know, it's a good speech. Uh, but still, there are things that uh, are left out. You know, the way things are in the land today, the growing poverty. People wanted to hear the big thing around minimum wage. Uh, people wanted to hear about how this subsidy whole thing will end. Because as you see, it looks like it's, it's parallel out of control, at least for the prices of, uh, of, of gas, diesel, with over a thousand naira. You look at the exchange rate, people would like, like to hear more about that. How come that uh, the naira is, uh, is, is equal to uh, one, one dollar to, to a thousand naira, over a thousand naira? So these are also disturbing issues around the economy, uh, the, the joblessness of uh, youth or growing unemployment, uh, how to combat that on a sustainable uh, basis. Uh, are some of the things that uh, uh, obviously a speech like that cannot cover all of this, but at the same time, uh, Nigerians, as we speak, the desperation is so much, the hopelessness, and people are looking for help. Uh, it may strike a chord in, in, in dealing with certain things, but the inequalities, the inequalities and the growing inequalities, social, economic, as we speak, uh, is, is something that people would like to get reassurance, okay. recommitment that they're on top of it. Yeah. Uh, so we will talk about uh, the details of the president's speech, but uh, as we try to get uh, a little more insight into what he said and how he said it, I think we should talk to Professor Adibe here. Uh, Prof has just talked uh, Perhaps it sounded reassuring you know, to an extent, even though there were some things I missed, but the president started the speech by saying on a solemn but yet hopeful note. 
What does that say to you? Well, I think he's, uh, as, as uh, Professor Zilo said, he deliberately wanted to come across as a compassionate man, his, his solemn speech. But let me even say, predicate my own intervention, you know, with something else. First is a big step that I think is the first time I'm seeing him use a teleprompter. And with that, we avoided that situation we saw at the U.S. Ongar's speech and the other speeches where he had to read and periodically lick his finger to <laughs> turn the pages. So that was, even though he looks a little more tired, you know, he, that's a big step forward. Um, having said that, I've always struggled, what should be the theme of speeches by the president on Independence Day? What should be the theme on June 12th? What should be the theme on May 29th? Should it be a report card of the president, which this sounds to be? For me, I've, I've always taken the position on Independence Day, 63rd anniversary, the theme should be on the journey to nationhood. On the Democracy Day, we talk about the theme should be on Democracy Day. You know, issues regarding our journey to democracy, the, the entire democratization processes. And then that should not be mistaken for presidential addresses, where, for example, you may decide to brief every month. That's where you present your report card. And that's my own opinion, that Independence Day we want to celebrate, we have come together. We've been around for, together for 63 years. So what are the obstacles we have overcome? Where are we going? You know, what are the, you know, what next? How do we navigate through the enduring challenges? Not, in my own opinion, about your report card. So that's my basic, and that has been my position, my basic disagreement with the theme of the speech. And we seem, on June 12, for example, you see the repetition of the same theme, in which then there seems to be no separation, no thematic separation between June, 20, June 12, May 29, and October 1. There should be thematic separations. That's my first okay. thing. And, um, before we go into the details of what he said. <laughs> okay, well, if we could get, just bring in Professor Dikwa here. Professor Dikwa, the, you've heard Professor Ezilo and Dr. Adibe here talk about, Professor Adibe talk about the different sides of the president's speech. And um, if I could borrow from what uh, Professor Adibe just said about a separation of Independence Day speech or June 12 speech or Democracy Day speech from the president's giving an account or giving a broadcast to Nigeria. But let's hear from you what your takeaway from this speech is before we will still get into the nitty gritty of the different angles that the president's speech de dealt on. But what's your takeaway from the president's speech today? Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, I greet my co panelists, Pro um, Professor Adibye and uh, Professor Oze, Oze Ilo. Mm. And uh, for start, Nigeria is the leader of the continent. When the president speaks at independence, he is speaking to the entire continent. Because Nigeria is a leader and the, the, the strongest economy in terms of resources and human capital. And therefore, it should go beyond the scorecards of one of thing. Nigeria, Nigerians have heard of the same things for a long time, over, over and over, promises, promises not coming to pass, including some voodoo economists and professors who will do and tell the entire world the wrong thing, and I suspect for, for peanuts, for peanuts, you know, they are being paid to do this. And therefore, Nigeria, how long Nigeria should continue to be, to be given assistance uh, uh, and uh, relying on uh, other countries for its policies. Nigeria has had everything, including the, 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 the weather conditions, the, the ecolo ecological favors from God. 
and this is a great country. 63 years is not a small thing. I am, I am one year older, 64, and you can look at me. I'm talking. I'm making noise. Um, 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 but Nigeria is still grappling with the concept of water, education, health care, and so on. Therefore, it is now we must put, come together, and uh, leaders should just keep the steering, others to follow. But what you do when you want them to follow is that the basic but the basics are given out to you. Basics such as, for instance, what I say, putting the uh, palliative, for instance, is for emergency situations. I said it up times and many times ago, and subsidies are rights, rights of the people, because your, your mother cannot be selling food and you, you find it difficult to eat. And therefore, any resource, any category of resource that we have, the money we get from it should be uh, wired to other sectors in order to alleviate the suffering of the people. That, was, that has taken away the absence of it, away the sense of patriotism for our children because they woke up to say their parents paying for their education, paying for everything. Why is the government coming? Come Why is it that it is always for Nigerians to, to exercise more patience and tomorrow will be better and that tomorrow has refused to come? I will give you an instance where all these um, politicians uh, do respect for the decent ones from our own independence to date. Uh, uh, all this restructuring, because politicians created only one state in the first republic, those great people who were slain, most of them, the Midwest, which is now, uh, which was Bendel and later Edo and so on. All the states, all the 774 uh, local government areas were created by the military because of the discipline. How, how much time will uh, politicians imbibe the concept of discipline, love, esteem, and, 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 and being humble to love the country everywhere so that anybody sees the okay. Nigerian passport we are respected? Okay, Prof. And uh, therefore, the independence should be more than just the scorecards. It is about hope, real hope, with time frame for people to sue it. Nigeria has nothing to do with poverty, with poverty, if the real things are done. But we okay. know that external forces had been on our neck since independence. We never liked Nigeria to be really independent and non-aligned. Okay. Uh, we will discuss these issues uh, quite frankly. Oh, thank you very much, Pro. Very good points you've made here. So we'll just go to Lagos. Uh, in our Lagos today, we have a Denny Kuno, who is a lecturer. Uh, from Lagos State University. Mr. Kunu, you've listened to the professors here say just about the same thing. Concerns about repetition and insisting that Democracy Day, Independence Day address should not be uh, a scorecard thing, uh, but should be more about the growth, democratic growth of a country. I don't know if that's the same position you share, and perhaps you could also tie that to what your thoughts are about the speech that you've just listened to from the president. I want to say thank you very much for having me this morning. Uh, before we talk about the textual or contextual analysis of the speech, it is good we look at it from a comparative point of view. Uh, it must be said that uh, President Bola Metinubu spoke for 15 minutes. The inaugural speech of President, uh, former President Muhammad Buhari was for 12 minutes, uh, cumulatively 27 paragraphs or 23, and of course 8,061 words. Uh, from my mental calculation, the entire words of President Bola Tinubu uh, came to about 1,200 to 1,500. That means the president at this moment spoke more than former president uh, Muhammad Buhari based on the fact that uh, they are from the same party. That's why I had to go that way. Now, let's not forget the theme of this speech. 
Nigeria at 63, renewed hope for unity and prosperity. And if I did a dissection of the speech, you know, generally, because we're still talking after the basics of it, it deviated after I got to about the third or the fourth paragraph, after talking about our diversity, the need for unity. And when it talked about prosperity, uh, we had certain things regarding airy platitudes, if I must talk about it, without addressing the core. Uh, the president just returned from the United Nations General Assembly. The picture painted there was that every country must address about the 17 uh, developmental uh, agenda, as it were, so that by 2030, most of this country would have performed 60, 70 percent. The core of addressing those things were not there. And of course, if you look at how the president left the country and how he has come to meet it, regarding the fact that in two days' time there will be strike action, the fact that this president inherited uh, lots of baggage with, regarding education. I didn't hear that as far as I'm concerned. It's our constituency. Everybody on this program this morning finds themselves within the educational sector of this country. It means that the president did not even address a core issue that's inherited from the government of Nigeria. If you move ahead to talk about security, the president didn't touch on the things I expect. We are coming to the nitty gritty of it, but I just need to remind him and many others who prepared the speech that 400 persons whose name were handed over to the Buhari administration, actually also handed over the 400 persons killing Nigerians, sponsoring Nigerians. We didn't hear that. I need us to understand that there are basics which must be attended to. 25,000 Naira in six months. What about the organized private sector of this country? Because the money is essentially mentioned for six months will go to those within government paid employment. What about the people? that have been operating private businesses and paying taxes for the past 20, 30 years? What about media houses that are privately owned? These are core issues that we should speak to. And I know that in the course of this conversation, further dissections will help us. Let's understand. The president also appealed to our diversity. Let's understand that these issues can be addressed if you look at the ground norm of the country. So whilst we examine the entirety of this, it's important for us to know that he has spoken more than the person who handed over power to him, but there are lots of issues he must address, not by criming it on top of it, but by really showing that it's key. Now, let's go again. In 2015, the inaugural speech of President, um, former President Mahmoud Buhari, he spoke very strongly, perhaps because of his military background, and secondly, because of the achievement he achieved, the achievement he recorded, I beg your pardon, maybe around the first three, four months of his coming to power in Meduguri, where we had lots of these non-state actors take over most of the local government, even where my professor from, uh, from Meduguri comes from. That is one part of this conversation. Then another thing will be that you have to speak, when you're talking about renewed hope, the person who gives hope must speak from the point of view of laying up the prostrate aspirations of people. And if you move away from that, it's talking about prosperity. We talked about removing subsidy. Subsidy was still paid for last month. We talked about the removal of it. So I'm still trying to understand the econometrics or the Nigerianometrics such that at some point we say we have removed. And at the other point we say we are paid for. Does it mean that we only removed theoretically and pragmatically or practically we have not removed? So sincerely speaking, renewed hope for unity. What are the issues dividing us as a country? President Muhammad Ubari, former president, divided this country a lot along ethnic lines. There, is, there was a consolidation of the same issues here. When we had the February and March elections earlier this year, my president at this moment must understand that when you speak to the issues of unity, now I've moved from comparative analysis to textual and contextual, you identify two, three, four things that are germane to the issues that cause this concession of the country, then you now move over to those issues and say, we identify A. Excuse me, as we speak right now, apart from the mixed emotions and the vituperations following the elections, there is the whiff of this unit in this country, and the dissenting understands that. While we're waiting for the Supreme Court to give us the verdict in less than 60 days, we're also looking at other areas of prosperity. In the first place, that aspect of, of subsidy paid for again has actually poked holes in the statement made by this president 
a month to the actual day of properly removing subsidy because he announced it in May 29. So it tells you that there are shaky policies that the president and his team understand better than myself because we are keen watchers and we provide the intellectual needed to steer the ship of this country forward. So when we talk about prosperity, for instance, labor had meetings up to four or five times since the assumption of office of this president and still deadlock upon deadlock before we had substantive ministers, after we have current ministers, those are key issues. So I'm addressing this particular posit from the point of view of what the president called the title or the theme of a speech, renewed hope. That's an intangible. How do you concretize hope? You concretize hope by letting people understand that you're moving away from promises without fulfillment. And you have two, three, four, seven bullet points ready to mash out your plan. So in terms of renewed hope for unity, how has the country been divided? Because poverty has actually emasculated a lot of people. How has the country been divided? Because of course, in terms uh, of- Mr. Kuno. Yes, I beg your pardon. Mr. Kuno. Yes, please. Yeah, you yeah, I, we, I know you're already going into the details of the speech, which yes, we please. say we will talk about, but I think All some right, points you've you. made are really key. One of them is the, the fact that the speech is not detailed enough. It raises the question as to whether and how detailed a speech should be, because you have pointed out some things that have that I missed. The president just touched on them and then sit on, sits, uh, perhaps dwell on them well enough. So let's go to Professor Ezilio now, based on what Mr. Kunu has said especially because this is the first address since the president inaugurated his cabinet. Do you, do you, did you expect that this speech would be as detailed as it is now? Now, also, if you could touch on something, uh, which is the unity of the country. The president, in every speech he's made, has started off by talking about the unity of the country. So do you think that that is something that has been addressed, or is it just uh, an all-talk thing with this administration? I think the issue of unity of country is something uh, our leaders have used to play politics past, present, and it will continue. Uh, but um, I don't think anyone uh, is deceived by that, especially for intelligentsia. Um, we need to just see uh, more action uh, towards operationalization of that. Um, like I said, is the first speech, um, is the first speech few months after uh, taking over government. And within that few months, uh, as we say in Nigerian palace, a lot of water has passed under the bridge. <laughs> People has become poorer. The situation has become um, uh, far more desperate because of removal of subsidy and the spiral event that has cast uh, in the economy. Um, today, uh, people are no longer, the, the, the poverty is so, uh, in fact, we, I, I don't know whether we, we, you said we are still coming back to it. We are just looking at the president's speech. In terms of details, I don't think a speech like that, nobody will want, uh, it's not possible to take on everything. Usually, Independence Day uh, should be able to tell us as a nation how far we've come, what are the key challenges, and how the government uh, hopes to uh, to deal with that. But unity, of course, when you talk of independence, uh, must always take a front seat in a way. So I can uh, pass him on that and say that um, he did the right thing to talk about unity of Nigeria. The past government uh, was so dis divisive, as has been said by the Lagos, uh, uh, it has been so divisive uh, along ethnic lines, everything and the hatred. I like him using the word also hatred in that speech, because it's something we haven't uh, had from a uh, past presidential speech. So it is important to really uh, reassure Nigerians uh, that we have a president uh, that would like to uh, not repeat the mistakes of the past, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to assess him or to judge him on that, we'll have to take uh, time before we can uh, hold him uh, to those uh, even milestones that he have set. Uh, because as, as we speak, he mentioned uh, the issue of, he, he touched on uh, different things that he has embarked on, uh, but still the one uh, that is causing uh, the hopelessness in the country, uh, the, the, the inequalities uh, that is just uh, getting widened uh, every day, uh, people will feel uh, that he did not uh, squarely uh, deal with that. 
Yes, Independence Day definitely, uh, you know, it's just one 20 days after him. No one expect that uh, all of the problem will have been solved or but at least wallowing into that, he has taken the bold step of uh, subsidy. People have debated in the past whether that was the right step or whether we put the cat before the horse or whether the things that ought to be in place ought to have been. The insecurity, um, he said he will secure lives and property. We've had that over and over. Uh, we can, uh, for me, depending on the part of country you live in, is not abating. Life has become so cheap, uh, abrogation of life. I'm worried about extrajudicial killings, the kidnapping that goes on every day. There is no safe school. There is no safe street. And, and, and people are just dying, you know, needlessly. So what is the what of a life of a Nigerian? That's what breaks my heart. You know, you look at other countries where people, uh, maybe a, a, a person is kidnapped or taken, people are abducted, abduction <clears throat> from school. <clears throat> And one year down the line, nothing. But these are things he inherited, actually. There are ones that already existed before he came into, the insecurity was there before he came into power. And we, we just, and in his appointment of service chief, we have seen a bit of diversity, which is welcome development. And I think he just have to take them to task. And we hope that he can, uh, uh, the commitment he has made that in a few months' time and before the end of year, Nigerians can begin to see with that. But addressing poverty remains paramount, remains imperative, living wage issue. Uh, this issue of subsidy again, uh, that we don't go back as some people are already saying and you know things like that, but the poverty that it has created in the country will need to be dealt with urgently. Okay, Professor Zillow, thank you so much. Um, Professor Adibe, now the president in his speech said, um, he said, the journey ahead will not be navigated by fear or hatred. Now, Professor Zito talked about addressing the question of poverty, the impact of subsidy removal, and what, and even uh, Professor Dikwa also talked about subsidy being the right of the people. So if subsidy has been removed, there are other subsidies, there are subsidies on other things, but the president has also talked about what they're planning or what they are doing about subsidizing transportation, the CNG buses. But this statement of his, the journey ahead will not be navigated by fear and or hatred. Well, I think it's a loaded statement. He may be talking about, uh, you know, the economic reforms, the hardship that, remember he, for a while, he celebrated himself for the removing of the subsidy he did say something that uh, it was not planned. It was not even in the written speech. He said he, he got there and was uh, taken over by the spirit of courage. That was, in the, these were his words. So in that sense, he had said, he was praised by the, especially the Western institutions for that courageous, quote unquote, decision. And then it only took time to emerge that perhaps it was a knee jerk reaction. It was an impulsive reaction. Because even in their own uh, manifesto, they said they are going to phase out subsidies. In, order, in other words, you plan for it. Because this is a road. It's like in forward to the past. We had under the SAP in the 80s where we, you know, subsidies were removed, you know, privatization. The entire Bretton Woods institutions um, uh, policies. We are not saying that in these days you must, uh, you know, left politics, extreme welfareism has become like a per se. But there should have been some more thoughts given to it. More importantly, to float the exchange rate at the same time as you're removing the subsidies. You know, you don't need to be an economics to know that it will have devastating effect. You know, it is going to shoot up inflation. At the same time, you are promising you are going to lower the cost of borrowing. That doesn't make sense. Um, we are seeing that. So the, until the cabinet took a long time to constitute, and before then it was like you take a decision and then you start trying to, you know, clean up the act. If you Look, for example, the Education Loan Act. Something that started in 20, 2021, there was not much thought given to it. It is not implementable. Why is it not implementable? For example, it says for you to qualify, your combined household income should not be more than 500000 Now, if you have a wife and two of you are working, it means your combined income should not be more than, say, 40 something thousand. 
before you can do that. Tell me how many households will have such a low income. And then, of course, you are going to present your tax certificate if you earn that minimum wage, you are tax exempt. And then it says, for you then to access that loan, you must present somebody who is a, a lawyer, a property owner, to guarantee you. Will you want to guarantee somebody on that minimum one do it? So as it is, it is not implementable. I heard the other day that the president said, remove all the obstacles on the way to its implementation. So these are been some kind of knee-jerk reactions. But having said this, let me also say that it is not unusual for new government to start on a very wobbly note. But, you know, to what extent, when is the short run? What should be the time frame for the short run within which you start to get your act together? You know, um, I think it's issue of subsidy. I agree with my prof from Medugri. All over the world, the European Common Agriculture Policy the U.S. farm gate policy, subsidies are there. And what they have actually done is to move subsidy from one sector of the subsidy to another subsidy. You move it from, you know, uh, where they are most needed. Because fuel subsidy cascades through the entire value chain. And then if you subsidize f uh, fuel subsidy and then fertilizer, you are subsidizing the entire economy. You cannot just say remove it. And we saw it when the Babangida tried so to do it. The problem, but there are those who argue that the problem about the problem of fuel subsidy wasn't exactly the subsidy, subsidy itself, but the, the implementation. Implementation. Look at the quantum of oil. They say petrol. They say we consume per month. Mm. It's not. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So it, we will have expected the president, you know, because uh, you know to have taken more time to constitute his cabinet, and then plan it properly, phase it out. I mean, gradually reduce the level of subsidy. And now that we are at it, one of, the one of the things that happened, which goaded the president, in my own opinion, in this kind of uh, knee-jerk decisions, was that under Buhari, uh, you know, the, the civil society, the protest community that usually will come out and hold him to account, they became aligned since 2015 to the APC government. So they, they started to speak from two sides of their mouth. So they now knew nobody, the kind of decisions Buhari took, I don't think any other president could have taken them and uh, gotten stock free. Even was, when he was being extremely clannish, he would come out and say, my conscience is clear. So he has also done something that, uh, despite the fact that he used personal diplomacy to get good position for some Nigerians, for which we must give him credit, okay. he also seemed to have done something. But, but I just want to ask you quickly, and mm. you pardon me. The concerns as to whether or not fuel subsidy is returning, because at some point it was mentioned that there would be a return to what, what at the time was called partial subsidy. And then there are those who now say that there was some payment of fuel subsidy last month. Does this speech tell you, was it emphatic enough as to whether or not fuel subsidy is back or gone? I actually wrote an article not long ago, and after the day I said, this policy is not sustainable. If we go back to FAT, we have foreign exchange. No, uh, beyond the policy, I'm uh, saying, the speech of the president, yeah. did he emphasize, did it seem emphatic enough to you that he was maintaining his no fuel subsidy? Yeah, that's position? what the government position, from what I read in the position, that this was like an intervention to stabilize price. That is not that the subsidy will come back. But my own personal belief is that both the flotation of the foreign and the Naira and the, the way the, the removal of the subsidy, they are not sustainable. And I'll be very surprised if in the next six months they are still there. It's simply not sub, uh, sustainable. You can't, and if you read some of the emerging papers now from outside the country, people are questioning, can you sustain it? But Bangida was not able to su sustain it. There was a prior. At a point, something will give in. And that's my honest belief. Mm. Uh, this... Okay, let, let's go to Professor Dikwa. You, uh, from what you said earlier about the rights of the people and the conversations that need to be had around this, you said a child whose mother is selling food cannot that go hungry. And in, in so speaking, you imply that Nigeria has left her children hungry. Is it about a leadership failure or is it about a people who are not seeing the resources they have and can use them to get to where they need to get? 
Great, this is a great question. Let us uh, remind ourselves that I earlier said that palliatives are for emergency situations, not a continuous exercise. Number one, I, I expected Mr. President to have taken uh, time to explain how uh, banditry, kidnapping, and insurgency happen. Obviously, the not not taking it seriously and laying emphasis is to give credit to the times. Pre former President Jonathan said, "We had Boko Haram in my government. We eat and drink together." So, my sister of uh, in, in uh, talking from Greece knows very well that uh, the advice given to them by World Bank and YMF as conditions have been difficult to even implement ten topics and it was, was deliberately done in order to tame Nigeria and discourage and in fact frustrate the youth from thinking about Nigeria as their own country a country that we inherited. So uh, the legislature and so on, we should fight against the expensive nature of, of uh, running for, for political posts and you spend huge. That, that uh, the second example that I wanted to give was that it's just like you, a a, a, a farmer, you are, you are a farmer of groundnuts, you have your groundnuts, you are going to sell it to a, a neighboring country completely. But particular uh, rendering all this into uh, practical, visible, and touchable uh, policy, it has all been uh, about uh, promises. And thanks to technology, the entire world is connected. We are talking directly, and that uh, how we are talking directly, and they are still fighting. The answers we should ask: Why? Why the Nigerian youth and or African youth are out um, endangering their lives to die in the Mediterranean Sea, almost on a daily basis, without them? And secondly, it's not a small thing to see normal human beings, um, ordinary Nigerians committing suicide um, recently in Lagos, Lagu, and so on. The leadership, the speech my uh, writers should be talking from the perspective of village person down to it. And that all the why is it that this uh, subsidy subsidy was removed prior to the fixing of the refineries? It government is in a better position to set to sit on the tail of the devil that has never has, has never liked Nigeria, have uh, 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 keeping Africa for the resources, not the human beings. Sometimes with NGOs playing certain funny things and so on, a few of them are good enough. And therefore, the speech is uh, impeccably loaded that needs more elaboration, perhaps later by Minister of, um, of Information, and that the national policy of Nigeria ought to have started from from uh, Africa from within the continent, and that was what actually cost the the life of the first republic. We said we will do it for our own country and leave a legacy behind. And therefore, if in, this insurgency, thanks to technology, and all these banditry, kidnapping, and so on, were created purposely in order to disturb Nigeria's peace to divide the, 
the, uh, uh, the, uh, the minds of patriotic professionals. Okay. Why is it that Nigeria trends, Nigeria trends brands that what allows uh, other countries to take away the brains. Okay, prof. Training and braining. Why are... Uh, okay. We well, have to find a deliberate way of uh, uh, filibustering what has always been right from 1986 under uh, President uh, 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 Babangida. Absolutely, prof. That's a concern. Uh, we well, might have well. heard about uh, SAP and TCPC and so on. The right, Nigerian please. child growing up should see the hand of government, a government of actors who ought to be identified and, in fact, prove themselves to be servant, servant of the people, not, not emperor uh, leadership, right? Absolutely. Of local government and uh, well, states and so on. Well, we're Therefore, we can, we can come prof, out prof, can again, me? we can all it. Listen, it well, is prof, Nigeria. For a yes, break. I can for hear a break. you very well. <laughs> Let me learn now. Nigeria, Nigeria is a great country, and the continent is now, uh, is now frightening the advanced uh, economies. They are afraid of the, the continent because it is the hopes of the natural resources that their industries needed it badly why why are our legislators still quiet with the with the uh, exclusion of the traditional institutions and values from oyo from my apologies from Karaba, prof. We're, we're, we're due for a break and now. everywhere prof, in the world prof, and I, therefore may... whatever that is written beautiful or said beautifully with queen language doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it is fruitful compare the countries that use their own mother tongue in the primary and secondary school all right that's a good point that's a good place and to leave it they, prof. we'll just take opted, it they they prof, opted, if you yes, can hear me please they, we, we we're due yes, for a break they, my most they sincere opted for technology apologies and prof. We're, and, and we're due for a break when we come of, back uh, we will take a look at the high points of the speech of the president and delve deeper into some of the things that he said. Perhaps what uh, so some things that he will probably give him credit in some areas if necessary and then uh, touch on some other things. We'll also let you know that we will be joined in the live coverage of the military parade which will be holding at the presidential villa. It was initially scheduled for tomorrow but it will now hold an entire any moment now. We will join that. You're watching channels, televisions and independence anniversary special please stay with us and we'll be right back to channels television's live coverage of the independence anniversary special we have our guests in the studio uh, professor Jidofa Dibe who's a lecturer from Nasrallah State University we have professor Khalifa Dikwa the dean Bruno Elders Forum he is in Maiduguri Bruno State we also have Adeni Kuno who is a lecturer at Lagos State University is in our Lagos studio and professor Joy Ezilo senior advocate of Nigeria who's joined us uh, from Greece let me go to Prof now. As we go into the high points of the speech, one of the things the president said was the uh, social uh, safety net program that's been extended. And he says that beginning this month, that uh, the, the cash transfer program will be to an additional 15 million households. Now, this program has been criticized right from the past administrations, especially considering concerns with regards to the data with which this is done. But you listening to the president talk about a uh, cash transfer program. What does that tell you? Progress or not? Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think, um, yes, people are worried. And just like uh, Professor Khalifa Dikwa said, uh, is not really sustainable. The issue of palliative, but of course, we, in every country, we need social safety net. 
uh, for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the weak. That is given. But then the large scope that Nigerians are running it, and especially with um, when even the data is, is not transparent, the issue of how the people's name come and who is really uh, supposed to be on that list. It has become, it was a problem in the last government and they are trying to say they are cleaning the register, they are verifying and I know some international organizations are also helping them to do that. But until that is transparently done, people are worried that it might become another conduit for politicians to patronize their own in every state at every level. Definitely, it's not the president that will be directly or federal government. It needs collaboration of state government. It needs collaboration of uh, local government. Uh, so at all levels, uh, people are imputing on this list. Actually, it is even more at, at grassroots level. And, and this um, uh, is disturbing. Uh, if, if Because the problem is that we primarily don't have good data in Nigeria. We've started the national identity number. We started, it, which didn't capture a lot of people are still out of it, or whether voters register, and uh, some also don't have even bank accounts, and there are people who are doing all kinds of a uh, racket with it, including also small uh, banking and community banks. So the corruption, the possibility of the, the whole thing is already you know, being corrupted or not being uh, as transparent and efficient as people will want to see it. I'm sure many people want to see vulnerable uh, groups receive the kind of assistance they need. They want safety net for the elderly, for the poor, for the physically challenged. But the widows, uh, children, orphans, uh, you know, child-headed household, female-headed household. But the issue is who and how did we come by those lists? And how can people go in a state and immediately see the people benefiting their addresses, even if it's not uh, they live in rural area? At least they should have a village quarter and all of that. And that's what uh, is important with the kind of palliative, because we are seeing a lot of money now being shared among states and local government, yet the poverty is growing in the land. People are hungry, people are angry, and the hydra-headed problem of corruption in all of this is not being addressed. And that is the problem. Even with the subsidy, we people want to see the accountability stake raised. Who are those who have profited from this in the past? Who are those who are still profiting from the situation at the present? You know, if we don't address the hydra-headed uh, problem of corruption in this, then none of this palliative or the current social safety net we are just creating in a vacuum will be sustainable. And that is the, the, the problem uh, that we currently have. I am for a safety net. It's, I am for providing sec uh, social security. Uh, for people who can't afford um, health care, right? Is there is a right to health care? There is issue of right to food, shelter, and all of that. But these are measures that the government will have not have to run themselves. There must be input of the civil society actors who can oversight and hold them to account, so that is not um, uh, subjected to abuse and the usual corruption uh, that is uh, we've seen replete in the system in, in the past. Uh, so um, the, the, the situation is, is really, I mean, we are just like kind of moving in, in, in circle and, and which is really uh, disturbing, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Um, and, and going back again to the problem of subsidy and why I agree with other speakers, Dr. Dikwa, Professor Khalifa, um, I mean, Professor Khalifa Dikwa and uh, Dr. Adibe and Lagos Guest. We, we, this ought to have been studied and government uh, can wobble at the initial takeoff is, is given, and Nigerians, we should be able to give them a bit of margin of appreciation of the difficulties and the problem they inherited. But at the same time, they should also be honest to say, yes, we did this. Yes, we have noticed that it's not working yet. We need to put certain things in place. I mean, one would have thought that, for example, there is no way you begin to remove subsidies at, at this level without making the well, refineries work, making sure that you open up that sector. This is not a rocket science. It's so painful when we talk about refining crude oil and then the fact that Nigeria, the export and then import of something so basic. I worry about it and my country at 63, because I said, if we are not able to refine crude oil, uh, we, then where are we going to get to space? People are going, they're using technology, benefiting 
uh, from technological advancement, and we even have a space agency. How can we get there in that space? And they have budget every year. When the basic things that people are even refining their fuel at the backyard in Niger Delta, selling illegally, and the government has failed successively from doing the needful. If we have no business with importation of fuel product, then we wouldn't have the situation we have. This subsidy might as well be removed. But if I believe that that is a cycle. We need to address the big fish. We need to raise the accountability state. Those who are making this country un not just ungovernable, but at the same time impossible for the, for the poor to breed. Not even, no longer even the poor. I don't know everybody now. Poverty is relative. Because even as a professor of law, you see people are poor. Your salary is worth less than $400. How can you live by that? It can, if you have um, a, a diesel car, you may spend the whole of your salary in a month to fuel it if you really want to use that car. Because a week will attract 80,000. 80 times 4 is 320. If you live in a university house as a professor, then that's almost your entire salary. So how is that sustainable? And there may be in those who qualify for social safety net, uh, for safety net, for, for palliative, a professor will not come in. What of lecturer one? Not as assistant lecturers. They may not be seen as qualified. At the same time, their salary is not a living wage. The same for every sector, for all civil servants. And that is what we should really worry about as a country. And because at the end of the day, you see people who have turned to beggars. You pity them. Colleagues, people are dying. People can't afford to even go to hospital to feed themselves, to feed their family, to take for granted the basic things that when we went to school, we took for granted. When we were growing up, we took for granted. They cannot. So that is the problem, and we must address that. And I think there is need for emergency, and government should convene that, have a think tank, look at this whole thing, and nobody will be happy if accountability is stake is not raised. Okay. So that because otherwise the same thing will be going on, and we are doing the same thing. And before you know it again, subsidy will come back because this is this subsidy journey is over three decades. Every time you say you removed, whether instrumentally you said it's, not, it's no longer there, then it comes back again. We are tired. And so long as productivity is not increased okay. and we are not okay. earning the, 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 the dollar power and the exchange rates at it is, then we are back to the same problem. Okay. And no amount of palliative okay, will Professor Zilo. leave people from poverty. Indeed. Yeah. Professor Zilo, this, uh, you talked about subsidy going back and forth. As there's no sneaking around the corner, trying to stay put, trying to go away whatever it is. But let's see the matter you talked about. Dr. Kunu, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Zilo has spoken quite a bit about um, honest conversations. Um, she called it uh, she called it honest communication, more or less, with the people, accountability with the people. But if you look at the president's speech, um, from the moment he said, at my inauguration, he said, I made important promises about how I will govern this great nation. Among those promises were pledges to reshape and modernize our economy and secure the lives, property, and liberty of the people. That's where he started from there. He began to go down about some of the things that are going to be done. He also mentioned, one of the first things he mentioned was that the, um, the average low-grade worker shall receive an additional 25000 naira per month for the next six months to ease the pressure of removal of fuel subsidy. Now, uh, when you talk about Honest conversations. Looking at the president's speech, um, do you think there is that, well, sort of like a lean towards honesty as per this is what we're going to do? It's not going to be easy. Indeed, it's not easy, but this is how we're going to go about it. It's all about the people. Well, I have to say that honesty is intangible and it can only be measured by the impact and the responses that people give to it when it is experienced. Uh, with regard to what he said, let's understand that um, one of the problems as mentioned by, you know, the last speaker was about, you know, the ridiculous amount earned in terms of $400 a month and some other things. The reality is every home has a budget based on the number of persons in that home. This country doesn't have data. Under the previous administration, uh, Dr. Yemi Kale, the statistician general of the country, shown that consistency, so consistent figures, but we didn't still have the number of the people living in a country that has been successively governed 
or presided over by leaders. The last time we had a census, 2006, the disputations at the back and forth of it came between Lagos and Kano, which led to Lagos holding its own census, saying that its own population is superior to that of Kano. Now, that dispute is still in the records of government. It therefore means that every president that has come between 2006 and now does not even know the population of the country. How do you plan for a country whose number you do not know? How do you provide for the poor when you don't have their figures? When this president assumed office, he's talking about having honest conversation. The first thing he told us was removal of subsidy and provision of some kind of reprieve for the people. 8,000 to certain number, of, certain amount of money to certain million households. Now, two weeks after, he instructed governors who have so far benefited from hundreds of thousands or millions of, of bags of grains, as well as billions of naira. He told them, get numbers together regarding social register. To, to date, I have not seen a governor come up with a list for that. Honest conversation comes from telling people that you intend to do this, and immediately such a statement is made, those you have given the matching order understand the implication on the honest conversation you are still having today by moving ahead to fulfill it. So honesty, as I said, is intangible. And the only way to measure it is the president has said this, we have moved what he has said to provide solution. So that is one part of the corner. In 2021, uh, in terms of the economic complexity index of this country, um, if we did um, a comparison of what Nigeria gained in terms of export compared to Singapore, while Nigeria made about over 57 billion, Singapore recorded 351 billion in dollars. Now, why did these countries achieve that? Because those countries paid attention to their citizens. The ridiculousness in thinking that foreign investors will come into the country when the road I drove on coming here as portals everywhere is something laughable. The empowerment of the citizenry is what in turn results in a generation of solution that the world sees and are attracted by. Some of us with every sense of humility have attracted certain international interest. Why? Because we give value at home and they see it. As a government, honest conversation begins first with knowing that leadership is an arduous task that demands a lot from you and you need the citizens to help you succeed no matter how powerful you are. So the basic that government should have done is that government said no subsidy. No matter what the situation is, before you mention that, you'd have tidied things up. It shows, therefore, that there's a hole poked into the honest conversation that this government wants to have with us by not being able to tell us that we'll remove subsidy and no matter what to do it. We went ahead with the Naira Convergence. The Naira Convergence is also part of the honest conversation we're not having. As of the time the Naira Convergence was implemented, where we as a country capable, measuring all the indices of strengthening the economy to have gone that way. Uh, your guest in Abuja mentioned something quite instructive, that soon after you removed subsidy, you went out to do Naira Convergence, and those cataclysmic experiences, those are part of the honest conversation. That I don't want us to leave the conversation of the minimum wage that you had. Uh... Mr. Kunu, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Before yes, you please. talk about the economy and the Naira, I want to stick with the issue of the new minimum wage, because in less than 48 hours, the labor unions will be embarking on strike. So, uh, and as we speak, labor has also released a statement with regard to this election, uh, this um, independence, and they've tagged it the travels of a mismanaged giant. So the question regarding whether the president's comments around the minimum wage and addressing uh, and giving out 25,000 naira per month to average low-grade workers will sort of, you know, suffice but to have perhaps make labor call off the strike should arise at this point. So when you hear the president say low-grade worker receiving uh, well, 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 25,000 naira in the next six months, All right, do you it's think that this is strong enough? Okay. And most importantly, how do we define a low-grade worker? Which category of workers? Because as you can clearly see, even those in the middle class, because of the state of the current nation, are dropping. Well, so how well, do you think that labor unions will take this? Well, well, I think that's going to be another problem uh, with labor. But let me remind us, and this is important for the world to understand. 2015 was the last time that the federal government should have actually increased, according to law, 
the minimum wage of Nigerian workers. And at that point, there were arguments and discussions around 30,000 per month as minimum wage. Now, it is expected that you'll be looking at those low-grade workers who maybe earn 30,000, 40,000, and 50,000 if, according to minimum wage standard, that is what the government intends to let us understand. In 2020, there should have been another upward review of worker salary. Now, this is 2023. In two years' time, there will be another request because those things are according to law. In 2015, when they talked about 30,000, the conversation was not made through. Many state governments are still owing even the 30,000. In 2020, another period has come and gone. Now, let's say this. Whatever labor does, it is because over time, labor has been strangulated not to actually have government have the honest conversation in fulfilling what it signs to with the Nigerian workers. Those labor leaders themselves are not those who, not, who don't think. They understand that it is honorable and dignifying for you as a government to sign certain agreement and fulfill it. Look at ASU, for instance. The problem we've had, for instance, I finished a, a four-year degree course in about five and a half years or six as an undergraduate at the university. And many people of my age and those that are older understand this. The reason is when government comes to the table of conversations with people and says, we have agreed, one of the things that successive administration have always done is to feel that they don't owe anybody the responsibility to actually fulfill what has been signed. The dignity of agreement, the honor of pact, the respect for what has been discussed. And let me tell you, honest conversations may not be a thing we have now because government doesn't even respect its own signature on agreement. The same government is supposed to provide leadership, provide direction. So while we're talking about the issue of the workers that are low grade, I think that the president in tomorrow's papers must do a rejoinder or communicate through maybe Adjur Gilali or the current Minister of Information that low-grade workers means those whose salaries are this. And government must also know that understanding the importance of data is key. You cannot give anybody anything if you don't have any list. Government must know that people should be able to say, Mr. A, B, C, and D collected this from there. Do not forget, uh, Mr. Godwin Emefele, the former governor of Central Bank, uh, was actually taken to court by um, Serap because you said you gave palliative. The former minister of humanitarian affairs also had not answered. At the period of lockdown, when we were not moving, people were moving about at the height of COVID, saying they gave people monies. We don't have names. We don't have addresses. You can't have honest conversations in that kind of situation. So there are lots of things shrouded in anger, mystery, and desperation that the government must begin to address. So the president tomorrow morning must instruct those who speak on his behalf, the all grade workers are Mr. A, B, and C. He must equally mandate those persons across the state that are governor that Adeni Ikunu is speaking against me because of you people. You do not have the list I've told you to bring over a month ago now. Whereas the same government was able to send prayers in the name of credit alas to lawmakers while the Nigerian people that voted them into office, both the president and the lawmakers, have not been attended to. So leadership means you lead, you take the heat on behalf of the people. So the president must explain low grade workers, but I think he may be speaking about those who are earning 25 to 30,000 naira a month. But also, let us say this. The private sector in this country have human beings that are Nigerians whose needs must be met, who have families. So government should not always be telling us things about this. Let me tell you this. At the height of the COVID, Saudi Arabia paid 70% of the salaries of workers that are actually in the private sector in their country. 70%. At the height of the COVID, Europe gave over 5.1% of its GDP to its citizens. Asia gets in excess of 8%. The entire Africa gets less than 1%. It tells you that there are certain problematics within the continent that are needful of proper dissection, perhaps mental situation, perhaps intellectual situation, because Nigeria is bigger than the experiences it goes through. I need to say that. All right.
Nigeria is bigger than the experiences it goes to. Let's get to Professor Dikwa here. Let's, let, let's, let's talk about this matter of Nigeria and commitment to nationhood. Again, borrowing from the president's speech towards the, the concluding part of his speech where he said, Professor Dikwa, if you can hear me, he says, the president said, fellow compatriots, the journey ahead will not be navigated by fear or hatred. We can only achieve our better Nigeria through courage, compassion, and commitment as one indivisible unit. Professor Dikwa, if you can hear me, the matter of commitment to nationhood, the matter of commitment to nationhood, to nationhood by its citizens. The president says to go forward, we need to do this courageously. We need to do this compassionately. And we need to show commitment to Nigeria as a people together. What's your take? Is that workable? Professor Dikwa, can you hear me? Okay, so if you can hear me, Prof, let me ask the question again. How can we get Nigerians to show commitment to the nation, even from the point of the leadership and the led? Okay, I'm not sure Prof is hearing us there. We'll come back to Professor Dikwa in our Meiduguri studio. Okay, Prof, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm okay. sure you can hear me now. Um, Showing uh, commitment yeah. to nationhood no, as a people. Exactly how we have to retrace our footsteps and uh, answer the question of how Boko Haram was created, who created Boko Haram and sent them to uh, uh, countries with huge resources. Uh, and uh, the, the speech of Mr. President needs elaboration direct talking to them is, is a very good Democrat who doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, uh, see, take people for granted. That is it. All of them, a few of them who are always willing to torpedo and filibuster the successes so far as Nigeria must be, must be reviewed holistically because many, many generals were retired, many professors were being persecuted to men and humiliated uh, uh, what happens. And therefore, we, we, need, we need a clear cut direction with time frame. In three months, we want to see this thing completed. In three months, we should be able to have a, 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 the silos open in order to, to distribute food to, to people. This thing is not there and deliberately done by a foreign, foreign interests in order to pitch the people of Nigeria against their own government. There's those people who are narcissistic, so they cannot do it what others do it because. Uh, those who believe in life after death, then you should be doing the right thing. Even if you are a, as, as a lawyer, for instance, you should be having the, the, the uh, opportunity to defend yourself. In the early 1980s, we were, were taught law, basically, particularly jurisprudence and so on, as far back as 1982, and this, this evidence uh, is, all, is still there, and that I say by and large Nigeria has survived many conspiracies from outside mm. because of the we are, we are a prayerful country mm. from across the borders, and okay. the entire continent of Africa looks up to us, up to Nigerians for leadership, okay, prof. rather than all candidates, if you remember, the tickets were sold at exorbitant uh, to deny youth and women from getting it. And mm -hmm. eventually what it became is this. Now, it's a Pro Professor Dikwa, if, if I may come, if I may come in here. Collaboration with the states. Professor Dikwa, yes. 
just to clarify here, I, I know you've moved on to talk about security, how to secure the country. I've talked about retracing our steps. But I, I was talking about the, the president in his concluding statement where he talked about the need to show commitment to Nigeria, the need to show commitment to Nigeria. Um, from the leadership to the led, what's the fastest way to get this done? Showing commitment to nationhood. Because the theme of our conversation this morning, besides the president's theme, is also about looking forward, building a better tomorrow, a new vision for Nigeria at 63. So how can we get Nigerians to show commitment to nationhood? Excellent question. Nigerians, about, it is mainly about subsidies. They keep the transport fares down because Nigeria... Uh, could afford to sponsor students from primary school up to university. And why, why is it that uh, Niger it's, uh, Nigerian intellectuals and generals are appreciated outside the South Nigeria? It is beyond the pay, monthly pay of this. I have many of my kids in the military. Uh, whatever this was, they, say, they know that it was the truth. The recent one, though not expected entirely, I will evict her from a head uh, government uh, headquarters, broad daylight, in order to to provoke me to turn my back off on my country. Nigeria is the best country economy. That yes. Therefore, anything submitted by professors like us and lawyers and so on should be discussed. It is, it is not an ideal situation. There is treachery in the sense that uh, we shouldn't discuss issues already on the, uh, on the bubble of uh, 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 we have on the table of it so that the Nigerian child growing up knows that Nigeria cares, and that is how patriotism is rooted. Ah, and I still remember when we were taught, uh, we were taught law, and mainly our first years in the universities. One of my my colleagues has just met him yesterday at a at a morning uh, of a great. Uh, legal colossus. So how uh, it is beyond do not whatever the speech contains, there must be people who will take up this, this and then uh, how to solve it. Sometimes asking questions about it because a hacker will do it and so on. And then uh, whether we we appreciate it or not or not. The, the, the child should grow up with his own natural identity and culture rather than dropping his own and traditional institutions and deny them uh, uh, access to the National Assembly. Uh, this is the uh, allegation is that uh, we are not going back. Nigeria has suffered a lot, has survived many uh, conspiracies. At one time, even the Secretary General of the United Nations kept wondering, because all these things are about economy, uh, econ economies. And that uh, my, my, my sister from Greece uh, put it there. Anywhere you go, you will meet a Nigerian there, very compassionate, very loving and caring, and uh, always standing by, by them in the moments of need. Therefore, I, I suggest that we have to walk the talk. The president has had uh, the best of experiences as a young man up to this age. And... Uh, uh, his vice president, too, had done a lot in, in the in the. Okay. Uh, All right, Prof. Uh, 
in their pursuit for national unity in Nigeria, uh, whatever this, if you are from the another region, for instance. Thank you very much, Prof. What can be overlooked by you can also be, uh, 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 it may not be, it may not sell through. And therefore, through, through, Mr. President should be able to to inspect and supervise the works being done across the country. And okay. never mind, never uh, 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 step down because Nigeria is a great country of opportunities. Like all these resources, if they are allowed to, to, uh, to be exploited and explored, mm. Nigeria will have been at least two times the beauty and infrastructure development uh, and so on. Very, very good point, Prof. Yes. Professor Dikwa, we, thank you very much. Uh, let's come back to the studio now to Prof. Professor Adibe while we look at the president's speech. You know, the president is speaking about uh, the other arms of government. Uh, let's, let's, let's sit with the National Assembly now. He said he takes his time uh, to congratulate the National Assembly for its role in the quick takeoff of his administration through performance of its constitutional duties of confirmation and oversight. Clearly, this is not detailed enough, is it? Especially because the president in his inaugural speech had talked about a jobs and prosperity bill which he would send to the National Assembly to sort of, you know, to address the relevant issues with concern to uh, employment. So when you hear the president make a speech uh, almost uh, five months, four or five months after, and all he says about National Assembly is congratulating them for confirmation of appointments and doesn't talk about any direct partnership or refer to that particular Jobs and Prosperity Bill which he had proposed right from the very first today. What does that tell you? Well, it wasn't only the National Assembly that he mentioned. He also mentioned the judiciary. I think that was his own way of trying to recognize the other arms of government. I mean, to bring them all on board. My primary concern, you know, when he made certain statements, very conciliatory, very compassionate, was that he should walk the talk. For example, in the midst of hardship, you have 48 ministers, a country as powerful as the United States, more populous than us, more resource endowed, far richer than us, has 15 secretaries of states, the equivalent. India, many several times our size, has far less the number of ministers. You have the highest number of ministers since 1978. Then the advisors. And it has also been, somebody had calculated that in the first 100 days in office, had, he and the Shitima, the vice president, had traveled far more than any other uh, government in this current uh, civilian dispensation. So we expect you to walk the talk. Um, if you want a lean government, you start it and people will look up. It wouldn't, you know, if you come to, if you are preaching, uh, you know, uh, the sobriety, you run an imperial presidency, then there is a mismatch between the talk and the work. That's one of the things we expect him. If you are talking about nation building, you know, under Buhari, we are talking about fulanization. Okay, maybe politicians uh, took it too far. Um, now people are beginning to say all the choice positions you are reserving it to, you know, your own ethnic group. You have to look at this. Yes, appointments are, is just, they are mere elite games, but optics from it is very important. So for you to be able to convince Nigerians and carry them along, I think you should do that. Let me use the opportunity to make one um, observation on the cash transfer. I agree with the prof from Medigri. This is only should be for emergency. I support the fact that we should start thinking of developing a welfare program. And the way these things are developed historically, looking at countries like Scandinavians, is that you don't take everyone on board at the same time. The so traditional social safety net we have, the, which is the extended family system, we all know is weakening across the country. As society evolves, those traditional structures tend to weaken. So you start to develop them. And you can start with one demographic. Say, for example, you look at people who are taking care of the elderly and who have no, 
no um, uh, relatives anywhere, then you start with that and gradually start bringing in more people into the net. This cash transfer, if you if you if you have not been eating well, and then for six months, your 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 budget, you are giving extra thirty thousand. What happens when that thirty thousand, the six months is gone? Is that you become your situation becomes worse because there is a deprivation now. You start experiencing a deprivation. If the extra thirty thousand has helped you to buy fish, to add fish to your food for the six months, and suddenly it's no longer coming. Now, eating without fish becomes more problematic than if you had never been eating it before. So you're not really doing them a favor. What we should have concentrated, in my own opinion, is in those macroeconomic policies mm -hmm. that will result in more people getting gainful employment. That's okay. the way I will look at it. Absolutely. We'll take a quick break now. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation and wrap up with our guests as we prepare to join the live coverage of the military parade, which will be taking place at the presidential villa. Please stay with us. Back, you're watching Channel's Television's Independence Day special. Uh, we have uh, Professor Jido Fuadibe, who's a lecturer at Nasarawa State University here in our Abuja studio. Uh, from our Meduguri studio, we have Professor Khalifa Dikwa, who's the Dean, Borno Elders Forum. We also have Adeni Ikunu, who's a lecturer at Lagos State University, here's in our Lagos studio. And Professor Joy Izilo, who is a senior advocate of Nigeria, who is in Greece. We were talking about the speech of the president and uh, some concerns regarding that. So let me go to Professor Ezilo now and ask you those questions. With regard to security, uh, there have been some, the spate of kidnap has increased. And I don't know if you feel confident with the way the president addressed the issue of uh, security in his speech. Um. I would say um, not quite, because um, it's a basic concern for every Nigerian. Growing in security, you can't do road travel, you can't also sleep in your house, robbery, burglary, everything is on the increase, kidnapping, abduction, no safe school, no safe street. You can't, and it's worse for women and girls. And of course, it affects every every Nigerian and every, every especially uh, those who are, are the governed, you know, and people don't, except those maybe who sleep in government houses. I think those are the only ones that may sleep with both eyes uh, closed. Uh, these days uh, you have to, there is no power, you can't, even if you have CCTV, can you run? So people are just basically restless, you know, uh, in the country. And I think uh, securing lives and property, and the president, it clearly said that, that that is his business. And I believe the president, Mr. President, the vice, some of the team, they have the capacity to do that. But in the, 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 the people want to start seeing results because every day from the news, it, it seems that it's spiraling out of control, totally. Because you can't tell me that people will be in school and people will come and abduct them and they will be cited in communities and then uh, all these things are happening. People are killed even on campus and it doesn't appear that the security is on top of that. And that will lead us back to the issue of trust. Trust in nation building. We, we, they need to also invest in trust. The, the governed, the people, the followership, they don't trust their government. And trust is predicated upon openness, open, efficient, and accountable government. If you have that and the followership is patriotic uh, and, and you believe in Nigeria, because people don't believe in Nigeria, people don't want to die for Nigeria, but they are being forced or through extrajudicial killings, dying every day. And it doesn't need, it doesn't look like people really put any value on their life. 
Otherwise, the issue of uh, the Dapchi girl, the only one remaining, the issue of Baptist school girls and Shibo girls and all over the kidnapping across the country. You'll be wondering. And then you see, why would people want to die for Nigeria? I love my country. And I don't have any other country than Nigeria. And I don't have a second passport. But you, 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 you see the way you are deliberately treated with this day because we're Nigerian. So how would you want? So I think the citizens' welfare, survival, and development should occupy center stage of any government. And indeed, the Constitution made it very clear that should be the business of government. But governments still run big government. People want to see more efficient government. People want to see uh, corruption brought to barest minimum. And those are things that will go into commitment to that nation building, we mean also addressing the hydra-headed problem of corruption. The insecurity we have today is not like something people cannot solve, but sometimes even now we hear collaboration between the community and the terrorists. The terrorists will provide, we promise them safe, safe passage. If you don't talk, if you don't tell on us, then so they are cooperating or they are being forced by reality to cooperate. And this should not happen. You know, we are we are in the world, you know, the, the security, and we talk of investment and production. I'm so sorry that it's not going to be happening in Nigeria very soon. We better look inward and solve our problem because any background check by any potential serious investor, let's accept corrupt investors who are coming to take away what they think they can take and make their money. Nobody will want to because every day adversary comes out, nearly more than half of Nigerian states are put as no-go area by European Union, by Americans. And so you that live in it, every day too, you know that is a struggle. You do, you go out, your your warned which car to take out, which car not to. Even you're walking on the street, you're not sure, even as a common, common man, common woman, everybody is at risk. Everybody is at high risk. So we need to refocus on securing lives and, 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 and property as the in, very imperative to survival of any democracy and for uh, for dealing with the issue of development. Because you look at the way people want to Japa, even people who are a bit comfortable want to Japa, why do they want to check out of Nigeria? Some people, because at least, even if they don't have money, they want to take basic things for granted, which is that it's not that crime doesn't happen in other crime. Crime is universal. But how you deal with those criminals, how they are captured, restores confidence in the people. But in a situation where in the past we've seen even a, a whole attorney general of the federation killed and nothing comes out of it. You don't know exactly what has transpired. It means nobody is safe. Everybody, you know, people are, uh, uh, you know, life has become so cheap. And what does it mean when we say we have right to life, right to life constitutionally guaranteed and is abrogated on daily basis? Especially through extrajudicial killings, non-state actors, and state is incapable, incapable of reining them in, of making sure that these criminals are held to account, prosecuted effectively, and brought to justice to restore the confidence of people, to even report. Because you definitely, you need collaboration from the people to, mm. to, to report. But if they are not confident that they will be protected, witness protection, then they will not also come up, they will not also come up and collaborate. So okay. we need to invest in community policing, Make sure that policing is local. I've been saying this forever. You don't expect to put a person from Enugu to Sokoto and he will go there and fish out the criminals. We must re restructure the country, Nigeria. We must restructure the, the Nigerian police and make sure that policing is local. And that is also part of the way they can deal with this uh, uh, growing okay. insecurity in the country. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor, Professor Zilo. Thank you so much. Let's let's go to Dr. Kunu. Our closing moments here, Dr. Kunu. So your closing thoughts. Uh, Professor Zilo has talked about the things we need to do as a people, restructure Nigeria. We need to have conversations. We need to get things going and work on our uh, consequence management system. So Dr. Kunu, what are your closing thoughts as we begin to um, close this segment of the show? Well, thank you once again. Uh, let's remind the world that in 2018, the administration of the APC had a meeting to arrive at the definition of the word restructure. 2018, this is 2023, five years after the APC uh, is yet to let us understand the definition it gave to restructuring because that is 
th that was actually how they went, so that they can actually provide meaning. And from the definition, we actually do something that will engender that patriotism along the lines of getting the definition of restructure. Now, let's not deceive ourselves. This country can function. But the agents that administer it must come to terms with the fact that the days of delusions are over. Now, Professor Izzolo was talking about security. Let's tell ourselves one thing very clearly. If we say that our country is incapable of providing enough technology to actually stop corruption or to stop fraudulent activities, the United Arab Emirates did the groundwork for you and gave you 400 names. People taking and giving money to buy ammunition with which they are killing Nigerians. And it was handed over to the administration of President, Bola, uh, President Mahmoud Bouhari and Gabashe, who spoke to lots of these issues. This is 203, a new administration. If President Bola Ahmed Tudubu must tell us that he's indeed ready to deal with insecurity issues, they should tell us whose names they have on that front list of 400% and how they want to deal with them. The Kuja prisons in Abuja, where your studio is, sir, was attacked. To date, nobody was sacked. To date, no video to show how they came and bombarded everywhere. No video to show anything. That is not a country that appears to want to deal with security issues because some people are living and breeding and eating with non-state actors that are killing those in this country. Don't forget, the open session of the Constitution tells us that the primary purpose of government is for protection of lives, lives first. How has the previous administration, because President Bola mentioned is not coming in around to carry this load, but we cannot excuse him because it's the government of the same party and it's the government of Nigeria. So for us to actually resolve this, government will first of all be determined based on all of these that have outlined to solve this problem. Then please listen. The resolve of the citizens to do well and do right is also important. If you come from a poor background, it doesn't mean you have to remain there. If you are from a country where government is unwilling to provide solutions, can we evolve strategies as citizens, first by our resolve to elect and to do things that will make this country better, such that if the political actors and gladiators come to us, they see a bulwark refusing to live in the past of deceit and retrogression as well as stagnation. These things are fundamental. I need to say this one more, that government must also lead with empathy, bearing in mind that nothing will be served a la carte immediately you get the mandate of the people. The reality is there's a deconscientization of people from knowing that their own is the position of strength and power. Many people who are the electorate have become reconscientized into thinking that they are the ones who should take the back seat and not resolve and demand from government to do their bidding. Government, including President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, is the chief servant and many other servants of the people. They are supposed to serve. And they serve with humility. They serve with honesty. They serve demonstrating capacity and requisite intellection to move the country forward. Now, let me examine this before I come back to you, sir. Three things are pivotal. Government is the first institution that enables the proper sensitization and acculturation of the people. Second, educational institutions. What has government been given as a group to the people such that they shore up believability, commitment, and patriotism? Number two, what have become the particular things doled out by educational institutions such that they are able to, the country has over 200 universities. What has the government done to ensure that these universities are representing the right ideals and providing the proper manpower to first of all solve our problem before it leaves. Number three, non-governmental organizations, not the ones that come around when elections are around the corner so that foreign government can give them grants. We're talking about non-governmental organizations that understand that it has the capacity to complement the activities of government to complement the activities of educational institutions and build a society that is indeed to be proud of. These are my submissions, and I must say thank you for inviting me into your studio this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Kunu. Uh, Professor Adibe, let's get your closing thoughts on this. Well, uh, as I said, I thought the issue of population building the journey so far. My own prognosis is that uh, the major challenge we face in this country is the crisis in our nation-building process. 
And I believe that unless we are able to come together and believe we are building a nation and resolve this crisis in, in the nation building, you will continue to see groups who are delinking from the Nigerian state and regarding the state as an enemy. Elsewhere, I've called this the process of de-Nigerianization. Unless we halt this process of de-Nigerianization and start building a nation in which all the constituent parts should regard themselves as stakeholders, if we don't do this, any solution you throw at any of the contemporary problems will only become part of the problem. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, at this point in time, we really have to hang it here for now. We do have, we had here in our Abuja studio, Professor Gideon Fouadibe, a lecturer at the Nasarawa State University. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. We had from our Medugui studio, Professor Khalifa Dikwa, Dean, Borno Elders Forum. Uh, Thank you for coming in, Prof. We also had from our Lagos studio, Adeni Kunu, who's a lecturer with the Lagos State University. Thank you, Dr. Kunu. Thank and, you very much for the privilege. Thank you very much. And then from Greece, we had Professor Joy Ezilo, who's a senior advocate of Nigeria. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts this morning with us. And uh, we looked at basically the president's speech. Uh, broadcast, Independence Day broadcast. He talked about a couple of things and a lot of things that I know a lot of people will be working on. He, One of the key things he mentioned there has to do with labor. And I'm sure labor unions will be riding on that. They'll have a lot to say in the next few minutes. But we do, uh, um, Terry mentioned earlier that we'll be taking you in the course of our broadcasting to the military Independence Day parade that's happening at the presidential villa. We'll bring that to you shortly. But for now, the Independence Day special, Channel TV Independence Day broadcast, will be ending our studio uh, right now and handing you over to the crew at the Presidential Villa for the military parade, the Independence Day military parade. I'm Neota Igwe. And I'm Terry Ikumi. This motion ignited the flame of independence, signaling Nigeria's unwavering desire for self-governance. The inaugural, um, you know, move at the House of Representatives we talked about was in 1953, a movement for, you know, the, 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 the uh, call for independence. Now, of course, it suffered some setback because there were people who were not who thought that was too fast. We wanted it in 1956. Um, but of course, negotiations went on in the course of the 1950s, and then 57, 58, 59, you know, uh, there were conferences that were held in London and Lagos where all the details were agreed to. And eventually, uh, the British agreed to grant independence on the 1st of October, 1960. So, I mean, it was, uh, the movement was, uh, a, you know, a collective of various factors and forces the labor movement was there, the press was there, um, there were uh, other groups, you know, uh, uh, that all contributed to, you know, like the Sizikis movement, for instance. Uh, they all thought it was, the time was right for independence to be granted. And don't forget, uh, Ghana had gone independence in 1957. So that was also an encouragement that, oh, uh, where is Nigeria? And of course, all of the disagreements were tidied up, uh, you know, negotiations went on. Which is why sometimes people say that Nigeria, Ghana, and some of these countries got independence on the platter of gold. Because it was not through war, it was through negotiations, and eventually the British agreed to independence in October 1960. Nigeria's independence intended to assert its sovereignty and achieve self governance. It was a fight for political, social, and economic freedom. The dream of an independent Nigeria was fueled by aspirations for a just society and a prosperous nation. Nigerians longed to shape their destiny and build a future where all citizens could thrive. Nigeria, we
On October 1, 1960, Nigeria celebrated its independence. During this momentous occasion, promises were made to the citizens. Today is Independence Day, the culmination of our dream, the fulfillment of a long cherished desire. While you in Nigeria are rejoicing, I'm rejoicing with you, for I feel that our new age has finally come. The age of freedom, of liberty, of dignity, of hard work and service to our, our beloved land. He went further to say, as we celebrate our independence, let us not forget the bonds that tie us to our African brothers and sisters. Let us walk towards the unity, solidarity, and progress of our great continent. Let Nigeria be a beacon of hope and aspiration to other nations. The promises made during Nigeria's independence included political stability, democratic governance, economic prosperity, social justice, and the protection of fundamental human rights. There was a whole lot of enthusiasm, there was optimism uh, as the anti-colonial movement was on, independence was underway, and for good reason. Uh, colonialism is defined simply as the establishment and maintenance of unequal relationships with political, economic, social, and the rest. So, I mean, a colonial rule, British colonial rule in Nigeria was, you know, naturally exploitative. And uh, the thought was that the end of colonial rule would end that exploitation where resources from Nigeria went to, you know, Britain, went to the West, so to speak. And that when colonial rule will have come to an end, all of those resources will be harnessed for national development. So uh, it was, the optimism was well placed. In fact, uh, the Ghanaian leader Kwame Nkrumah used to say that, give us a political kingdom and all of that things shall be added unto us. They thought that colonialism was exploitative and if and when it was brought to an end, the resources that were taken away will be harnessed, exploited and used nationally and that would translate to development. Indeed, um, you know, uh, shortly before independence, the optimism that developed led uh, social scientists to begin to speak of a revolution of rising expectations. Uh, but after independence, reality dawned on everybody. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long before optimism began, began to give way to pessimism and hope began to give way to despair. I'm a Nigerian, but I'm not a proud Nigerian because we were not able to meet the aspirations of our independence. It seems we are more divided now than we were in the 60s, when we were only 33 to 35 million. Now we are over 200 million. And you can imagine the fault lines that we have today are much more than the fault lines we had during that time. So it's rather very unfortunate that uh, these days or nowadays, we have leaders who are only think of themselves than being true nationalists as uh, we've had the forefathers and the earlier leaders of this country have been. I think the missing link is the, that nationalism. That's what really erodes us and uh, put us in this way, yes. In the early days of independence, Nigeria accomplished significant milestones. The country transitioned from a colony to an independent nation, established a federal system of government, and held democratic elections. I remember the cement industry in Nkalago, Enugu, as a little boy of about uh, 11, 12, 13 years old. The Turner's asbestos industry in that same Enugu they were manufacturing roofing sheets from asbestos and so on and so forth. And then Michael Opa established the trans Industrial Estate here in Port Harcourt. And all these industries came, manufacturing this, manufacturing that. I remember vividly Michelin and so on and so forth. Tire manufacturer here in Nigeria, Port Harcourt. Nigerian Tobacco Company. Beyond Stella Maris, at the place they call Reclamation Road, I saw those places. 
there were a lot of industries and employment was for the asking. You follow? The oil companies had come, established, Shell had been here before the war. But after the war came Santa Fe, which later metamorphosed to become ELF, and then now it's called uh, uh, Total Fina ELF, all that. Industries were thriving. In 1962, the government set up a commission, the Morgan Commission, you know, to look at the well-being of Nigerians. And the report was that Nigerians were actually worse off in terms of quality of life mm. by, night, by the end of 1962, compared with what it was before independence in 1960. So things began to take a turn for the worse right up, you know, quickly, very, very quickly. And by 1963, of course, uh, people began to, you know, uh, wonder whether the independence that people fought for, uh, whether all of those things that people expected would ever be realized. So we got it wrong quite early. And that was because there was no vision, there was no commitment. Um, policies continue to be dominant instead of governance. Those were the things that, you know, caused the problem very early on. And of course, coupled with what we, historians, describe as politics of bitterness, which, which characterized the First Republic. However, the country faced numerous challenges in fulfilling their promises, part of which were due to military incursions. In January 15, 1966, July 29, 1966, counter-coup. July 29, 1975, coup. December 31, 1983, coup. August 27, 1985 coup. The 1993 coup. And finally, General Abdul Salami Abubakar served as the 11th head of state from 1998 to 1999. Why there were other minor coup attempts and military interventions in Nigeria's history, these significantly affected the country's political landscape. The military is not trained for governance. You follow, they are trained for battle. Security and, you know, emergency situations when they need to be called out. And they're armed. They're just trained to take commands and go and uh, do battle. The police itself, took a downward slide. Because when the military came on board, they stopped funding the police to the extent which we expected. Because the police is the law enforcement arm of government for maintenance of civil law and order. When we were living in Enugu, you rarely saw soldiers. Even though I was living in Enugu, Tetinana Bakliki Road, right next, there was just a road dividing our house and the, uh, the uh, military barracks in Enugu. You rarely saw soldiers on the road. Rarely, but military rule came, and the army, the, mil the navy, and the air force were now the ones administering. They had a supreme military council, armed forces ruling council, and all that. They did not have the acumen to administer Nigeria. And that was where we lost it. From the point in time when we became an independent nation, and the Prime Minister, Elijah Tafa Belewa, and the Zik took over power to manage the, the activities of the nation. Then we suddenly noticed a whole lot of corruption coming in. 
which is part of the reasons that the military gave when they took over power. Now, within the period that the military was in power, the question would be, why there still corruption? Yes, to some extent. Nepotism actually came in. Tribalism also came in. Because before then, the military, the Nigerian army, used to be the strongest, the most united of everything we had in Nigeria. And at the point in time when tribalism came into the Nigerian army, it brought a big division, which went beyond the army into the Nigerian society. And this actually have affected us. Nigeria's journey towards fulfilling the promises made during independence has been a complex and arduous one, filled with both achievements and setbacks. Nigeria has seen joy, Nigeria has seen pain, suffering, and the worst of it all is that Nigeria saw the civil war. And that civil war almost broke our unity. That civil war brought us to our knees. And at the end of the day, the then head of state, General Yakubu Gawa, said, no victor, no vanquish. And so we went into a process of reconstruction and reconciliation and trying to build a new Nigeria. And one of those institutions that government put in place was the, uh, the National Youth Service Corps, which was put in place to bring about reconciliation. Uh, many people who did youth service, uh, people like us, I served in Jos, and um, people went into places that are not originally there to build and rebuild confidence in the country called Nigeria. That civil war didn't need to happen. That civil war taught us that we can always go to the negotiation table. That civil war taught us that military might will never bring about peace and reconciliation. Myself, as a young person who was uh, probably three years, three and a half years when the civil war broke out. I saw pain. I saw starvation. We were living inside the bush intermittently for the whole three years. We ate raw food. We ate food that nobody should eat. We ate what animals ate because there was nothing to eat. We saw malnutrition. You will see a fellow young boy dying by your side. And so, Many of us who saw it, that suffering and pain, we never want to see it happen again. My grandfather told me a story. People kept the law in those days. The story told is that a young man in my village killed the wife out of some argument. The nearest police station at that time was in Ahuda, which was then the capital of the division. They call it the Ahuda Division, which my own area of Ikwere land belonged to. They had to go to Ahuda to report the case. It took nearly a day for one lone policeman, barefoot, carrying a button, to walk from Ahuda to get to my village at uh, Rumokoro. By which time the youths had arrested the man, you know, in quotes, arrested. That is, they had caught him, restrained him, and tied him up. So he was just sitting there waiting for this policeman to take him to Ahuda. The policeman came barefoot, handcuffed him, and then they started trekking back to Ahuda. But then there was law. There were customary courts and magistrates' courts, very few and far between. But Nigerians were more law-abiding then. Despite the challenges, Nigeria has not been devoid of progress. The nation has made some strides in education, healthcare, and infrastructure development. During the process of growth, something went wrong. Where we got it wrong, I don't even know myself. But if we can all look backward and realize that there was a time Nigeria was in the pedestal of development. And we can remember Nigerian Railway that was working because I entered Nigerian Railway. I went out, I entered business class to my school. I was doing boarding school. I remember there was a te te uh, textile industry. I, was, I remember there was Bashita Sugar Company where we were producing sugar. I remember there was a lot of uh, lay, lay land Oluwa Glass Factory, those are the things I have seen that make Nigeria an industrial nation 
Dunlop left Nigeria. Machelin left Nigeria. What makes them to leave Nigeria? Where do we get to from? That disconnect is what we need to find out what makes us. Because if we are moving and you think where you are going is not, it's not promising, we need to look backward. Because if we don't find out the failure of yesterday, we cannot sustain the tomorrow we want to build. I graduated in 1977 from Ife, went to law school, 1977, called to the bar in 1978, and then went to Medugri to do national service. Go one must be commended for establishing that corps, the National Youth Service Corps. Now, even now, the principles behind the establishment of the National Youth Service Corps have been watered down. People can now choose where they want to go to. For some flimsy reason, that they are pregnant, that their husband wants them to be in their state, that they have this illness, which is, uh, you know, some nebulous idea. But I went. My father said, go to Medugri. The NYSC, which was introduced in 1973, the Unity schools were there as well. The, there are so many other policies that the government, well, mostly the military government, had tried to introduce into this country, particularly to foster unity and togetherness. Now is a sham. People hardly go out of their states to serve. You wonder, what is going on? Of course, you don't blame them because there is insecurity almost everywhere. People hardly go, you see federal unity schools, mostly domiciled for the people or for the indigents of those states. And that is not the idea. The idea is you bring people from all across. At 11 or 12, I was in Sokoto. At 11 or 12, I've never traveled, but I went to any school in Sokoto. And that taught me a lot. It opened me, prepared me for the future. Now kids of nowadays hardly have that opportunity. You see, going around, moving, meeting new people, making friends, and fostering unity. To me, the politicians are more to be blamed for this because, you know, the game of divide and rule. And it has always been like that. Looking towards the future, Nigeria aspires to sustain economic growth, reduce poverty, enhance governance, and achieve lasting security. There are a number of areas the nation must leverage in order to pull off a major leap for its teeming population and establish its dominance in industrial space. Let me just give an example regarding economic development. Shortly after the end of World War II, the British re realized Nigeria, before then they had already realized that, but after the end of World War II, demands for primary products in Europe expanded tremendously. Um, cocoa, uh, palm produce, palm oil, uh, uh, peanuts, and all that. The British made conscious efforts to expand production of these things in Nigeria and exported. You know the result? In 1947, Nigeria's total earning from all of this was 14 million pounds. By 1958, Nigeria earned 81 million pounds. You can see from 14 million pounds in 1947 to 81 million pounds in 1958. That we see the, the, the... But Nigerian leaders after independence didn't leverage on that to continue to expand that, you know, so that after independence, we saw a gradual you know, uh, uh, reduction in both, you know, production and export of this product. The low-hanging approach to our agricultural development is our local government. Every local government has gotten their strengths. Tax each of the local government. What can they produce to, f to heat and to export? Because this vulnerability of Naira, if we are exporting, is a blessing to us. The, the dollar will be available, and farmer will be enriched by what they are exporting. These are things that we need to put in place, and it has to be declared as a state of emergency. Our industrial sector is simply almost a, a comatose. We need to have a blueprint as to what we want to leverage on in terms of, you know, uh, industrial production. And there are so many areas, you know, we can focus on. PCB design is the art of electronics, and it goes across 
every form of electronic you can imagine, being robotic technology, being artificial intelligence, being anything, electronics is the future, whether we like it or not. Let me, let me even explain to you, part of the, this PCB fabrication and design is needed in the defense industry. All rocket design, all armor tank design, all their dashboard, all their control board, are all PCB. Even the heart of aircraft, they are all PCB fabrication and design. Because they all have electronic board controlling them. And these are the capabilities we can build if we encourage that course to be run, in fact, in all our universities. Without electric power, you can't really do much because you would not be competitive. You know, more often than not, it would be a situation where imports would be way cheaper. And it shouldn't be that, but it shouldn't be the case, especially when you have those natural resources or those resources or raw materials in abundance. That's where the challenge is. If, if we don't have access to public power supply and everyone is having to generate their own electricity um, individually, and that's a challenge. Because I'll give you a scenario. Public power, power supply from the grid will not, at this time, gas prices, all of that, will still not exceed the 100 Naira. But if you begin to have self-generation, you speak about 190, 200 Naira per kilowatt hour and more. You'll be anywhere from double, triple, four times what it is to have public power supply. In terms of where we are with power, public power supply, I, I will say that um, we, it's been modest, very modest gains from where we started from. We, we usually would not exceed 4,000, 4,500. And unfortunately, even the grid, depending on who you speak to, some would say can do 5,5, five, some would say max of 7,5. We, we are still far from where we should be. On the average, I don't think this country needs less than 100,000 megawatts to start with, to begin to talk about industrialization and, and, and the sort. And we, have, we are not anywhere close to that. We are about 4% where we should be at the very minimum, we're about 4% where we should be. And that's very, very small. If we are 4,000 out of 100,000 megawatts. So that's where the challenge is. We don't have to have a grid power. Whatever that will make all our power units, all the small hydro, small solar renewable, and every other thing to generate power and distribute within their cluster is what the government needs to promote because we need power. We need steel. Whatever it takes this government to allow our iron and steel to work, whatever it takes Dangote refinery to produce all petrochemical product, because those are the backbone of industrialization. We need power, we need petrochemical, we need iron and steel. Those are the strength of industrialization. As we reflect on Nigeria's journey from colonial rule to independence, it is evident that the promises made during this historic moment continue to shape the nation's aspirations. Nigeria strives to overcome challenges, build a brighter future, and fulfill the dreams of its citizens. It is a new administration and another independent celebration. We must find reasons to keep the wheels of progress turning. Congratulations, Nigeria, as we celebrate 63 years of independence. But even in the midst of the celebrations, there are some concerns and some questions. 
Have the expectations of our founding fathers in 1960, have they been fulfilled 63 years after? Well, we have to share her perspective on this and a whole lot more. The daughter of someone who was really close to power at that time, the daughter of the late Chief Festus, Okotiebo, he was the Minister of Finance at that time. Her daughter, Dr. Jeria Wishika, has also grown and made her own footprints as she's worked both in the private and the public sector. Just retired as the chairperson of Access Bank PLC. So you're so welcome to the program, Dr. Wishika. Thank you. So, Mom, would you say 63 years after that the expectations and the joy and celebration of the 1960 have they been fulfilled? The answer to that question will be yes and no. Yes, because we're in charge. We're Nigerians, proudly so. And we now govern ourselves. Great victory back then. And one of the speeches that I know that was said is, we have been able to put the Nigerian flag high up there and bring down the British flag. No more governing us. But today, that kind of looking up to the Nigerian up there, is, we are still not there. We have to say the truth. 63 years after. We're still not there. And the hope that was given to us as children then, when we held the flag, Nigerian flag, flying it, is to say we have arrived. So your question is, have we arrived? No, we have not. So where would you say we have missed it in the midst of the celebration and uh, all of the expectations from Nigerians and the leaders? Um, where did we miss it? I'm a detribalized Nigerian, and I'm proudly so. And looking back at history, when Nigeria gained their independence, you look at the pictures. You people show it on television. You look at, you read and see everything. You find out that it was not one man's doing. It was a consensus of top Nigerians representing their people not just themselves, that fought for the independence of Nigeria. Whether it was Tafawa Balewa from the north, the man was from Bauchi. Whether it was Azikiwe from the east, from Onicha. Whether it was Sadauna of, uh, of Sokoto, who was then in uh, Ahmad Velo in Kaduna. Whether it was Awolowo from the west, from Ijebu Ikene or it was Akintola, the late Akintola as well, from Ubumosho. And you can mention that my dad too, Chief Fefes Okotiebo, from a minority in then Midwest state, now Delta state. Maja Kodumi, you can mention a whole lot of them, Todd Bensi, a whole lot of them. They came together as a people, not as their tribe. As a people, not of their religion, they had a common vision, a common purpose, and the purpose is let's put our hands together and let's show ourselves strong to be able to govern ourselves. And when the British people saw that Nigeria was ready in unity, there was no war. There was no talking much like other countries. They just allowed us to go because they had confidence in the capacity and capability of the governance that will take place after the coup. And that's what happened. Then the coup came in 1966, January 15. Unfortunately, a good and a bad date for me. That's my birthday. And that's the day the coup happened. And my dad was killed in that coup. Let me tell you how conscientious and how proud they are as Nigerians. At about 1 p.m., 1, mid, 1 a.m., midnight, the then Nigerian British High Commissioner to Nigeria 
came to my father to alert him that there will be a coup. Let's take you out of here. Because he was somebody who was very, very, very friendly with the international community for good of Nigeria, being a, a finance minister. They will come and, I, and there will be a coup. And he said, I, I am a Nigerian. I will not live here to stay under the British High Commissioner Office or House. He picked up his phone and called it. The Prime Minister, Tafawa Balewa, who is next door to our house, he lived next door to him, said he didn't div divorce where, divorce where he got the information from. He said, I have a very reliable information that there will be a coup tonight. And the Prime Minister said to him, call the Aronsi and get the facts. He called the Aronsi and the Aronsi said there was nothing like that. He called his mentor. Azikiwe, the president of the country. Mind you, Atafa Balewa was prime minister, Azikiwe was president. He was um, on a sick leave outside the country. He said he too will find out. The gentleman, the, the British High Commissioner, was there until about two. Called the long story short, not long after he left, the coup plotters came. He hardly didn't sleep. He slept on the, he stayed on the corridor waiting to see if anything will happen. It did happen. They picked him up. They wouldn't have found him if he didn't love Nigeria. He would have left. They wouldn't have found Abu Bakr if he didn't love Nigeria. He would have left too because he told him. But they picked him up and they went next door, picked Abu Bakr. He simply said, according to our oddly who ran after them, very loyal man, Amadi, I still remember the name, said, the father will simply say, let me see my prayers and I follow you. He said his prayer and he followed them. So that's the story of loyalty to Nigeria. And that brings me back to your question. Do we love Nigeria today as leaders and as followers? Do we love Nigeria? Do we see a future for Nigeria as leaders and, and as followers? We need to ask that question of ourselves, um, debriefing our minds of where we come from and what religion we are, which faith we stand for, both of which are personal and not public. So we have dominated the public space with personal issues. So there needs to be a reversal. So, ma'am, how do you think this love, loyalty, and patriotism can be revived? A broken vehicle that the engine has not knocked. Tires are deflated. Glasses are broken. Steering is locked up can be revived. So Nigeria can be revived. It's just broken in diverse ways, including followership. Because we think that only the leadership will change the situation in Nigeria. I agree, leaders are important, very, very key. They are the drivers of the vehicle. But the driver cannot drive himself without the vehicle cooperating. The people are part of governance. People are part of governance, to be honest. And I think that patriotism should not be lip service the way we call it in Nigeria. It has to be a civic responsibility. There's a responsibility that goes with the word patriotism. I remember very clearly, I'm very dear to my heart, when Yaradwa came in, the first pronouncement he made was the rule of law. He didn't say more than that. I come to establish the rule of law. We are very, very lawless. We don't want to obey rules. 
and regulations. So whether they be economic rules, we are not obeying. Whether they be security rules, don't jump the gun. Don't cross the red light. We are not obeying. Whether they be fiscal responsibility regulations, we are not obeying. So who will then turn it around? The spirit? One man? Difficult. We need to make up our mind. And I think we should know now especially with the Japa syndrome. People are going. It's good to have a place to go. But are they really accepted? At least I've met a few who asked me they want to come back. Yes. If the opportunity exists, they say. If the country gets better, they say. We need to come back and make our country better. Particularly, our generation. I say so in my generation, we have a responsibility to begin to form core groups that can grow a better nation. Because we met a good nation while we were growing up in every respect. Health, education, social responsibilities, economic, name it. We met it good. We met it. I attended Ahmad Bello University, and I'm not from the north. I never knew that there would come a time. I was telling one of my mates in the school then. She used to live two rooms away from me. And I said, did it ever occur to you that I'm a Christian, even though I go to fellowship quite often? She said, yes, she knows. I said, but did I ever look at you? that you are a Muslim? She said, no, but you used to make food for us uh, to breakfast when we are in our fasting time. I said, could you tell that to others? Let's shout it out. Let's tell people that you were in the third room, I was in the fourth room, and this is the way we live. I needed my faith. This is Channel's television. You're watching our series of interviews and documentary as part of our 63rd anniversary independence celebration right on channels television. We now head over to the nation's capital, pictures you're seeing live from the villa where the president is expected to give his remark as the military do their parade to stay with us.
to this historic arena by Gas Brigade Bike Pipers with their tires known as Kit. Uh, we'll be ushering the special guest of honor with the Scottish melody known as Scotland the Brave, composed by Harry Lauda in 1950. At this moment, Your Excellency, permit me to hand over the microphone to my co-compare, Major Paul Abara, retire to continue with the proceedings. Major Paul Abara, sir. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Obi Olokodano. Your Excellency, the Vice President, the Lordship, Excellency, the Senate President, the right Your Excellency, the Vice President, the Lordship, the Excellency, the Senate President, the Right Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Lordship, the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Your Excellencies, former President, former Vice President here present. Distinguished Honorable Members of the National Assembly, Honorable Members of the Federal Executive Council, the Chief of Defense Staff, Service Chiefs, Inspector General of Police, very senior military staff, but serving and disabled and retired. Your Royal Highnesses, my law spiritual and temporal, chieftains and captains of the organized private sector, Officers, ladies and gentlemen, it is dignity's arrival unfolding at the four courts of the President Villa, where ceremonies commemorating the 63rd Independence and is taking place. To climax this hierarchical arrival of dignitaries will be the arrival of the very special guest of honor, His Excellency President Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. His Excellency Ashiwaju Bola Metinobu, Grand Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic, please, when we announce his arrival, in absolute deference to his most exalted offices, we are always expected to rise. His distinguished persona will rise on our feet wherever we are sitting, please, with all due respect and deference, please. And when the band on parade renders the national salute, officers, one of you should please salute. Band, some more musical interlude, we'll expect the arrival of the special guest of honor, please. Band, thank you. Scintillating, entertaining, redemic. Thank you. Your Excellencies, standing on existing protocol, 
Today's occasion is most unique. It is the 63rd independence anniversary of our great nation, Nigeria. 63rd. We want to acquaint our distant guests with the guards on parade. Now, we have two guards on parade. The guard to the left of the colors on parade, the guard representing the Nigerian army, the Nigerian army guards. And to the right, symbolically, is a guard representing the outgoing colonial guards. And of course, the dropping of the Union Jack this day, 63 years ago. Now, the guards representing the outgoing uh, colonial guards, we have there an officer and personnel from the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Air Force, and the Nigerian Police. We want to meet them briefly. Now, today's parade commander is Lieutenant Colonel Moshud Abiodun Yusuf. He doubles as the commander of South Seven Guards Battalion. He was born on 30th May 1984 in Shobolu local government area of Lagos State. He hails from a Kenai local government area in Ogun State. He was admitted into the prestigious Nigerian Defense Academy on the 27th September 2002 as a member of the 54th Regular Combatant Course. The senior officer was subsequently commissioned on 30th September 2006 as a second lieutenant into the Nigerian Army Infantry Corps. He holds a BSc Honors Degree in Accounting and a Master's Master of Science Degree in Defense and Inf International Politics. Lieutenant Colonel Elmi Yusuf is happily married and blessed with children. The parade commander's 63rd Independence Anniversary Parade, the Four Courts, President Villa. Now, the two guards on parade. The old guard is commanded by Lieutenant, uh, that's uh, Navy Lieutenant Commander J.A. Uluwale. He was born in Kaba, Kogi State. He hails from Kababunu local government area of Kogi State. He was admitted into the prestigious Nigerian Nav Naval College on uh, Port Harcourt, River State, on 4th May 2018 as a member of the Rights of Short Service Course 25. The officer was subsequently commissioned on 15 December 2018 as a sub-lieutenant into the Nigerian Navy. He holds a higher national diploma degree in a library and information science. Now, the new guard commander is Major Jamil Man Issa. He was born in Mina, Niger State. He hails from Bida local government area of Niger State. He was admitted into the prestigious Nigerian Defense Academy on 3rd September 2016 as a member of the 68th Regular Combatant Course. Uh, the senior officer was subsequently commissioned on 9th October 2021 as a second lieutenant into the Nigerian Army. He holds a BSc Honors Degree in Geography. Now, once again, there are four colors on parade. We did say a while ago. It is historic and very, very unique. What we had experienced the past weeks, the past years, had been two colors, principally the national color of our great nation, Nigeria, and the regimental color of the Nigerian army. But today's occasion, very unique, is a symbolic rollback to October 1, 1960. Now we have the guards representing the outgoing colonial guards, and of course, since we have the Navy, the Air Force, and the police on parade, now the Navy and the Air Force colors are on parade. So we have four colors on parade today. We have the national color of our great nation, Nigeria, green, white, green. The regimental colors of the Nigerian Army, the Nigerian Navy, and the Nigerian Air Force. Along the line, we are going to meet the end signs of these colors. Highly disciplined, trained, committed officers. Ban some more musical interview, please. Thank you. While we're with the arrival of the special guest of honor, ban, please. Thank you. Well, we're with the arrival of the special guest of honor. Bang, please. Thank you.
Thank you. Mas Vernon Brewing. Your Excellency, the Vice President, standing on existing protocol, while expecting the arrival of the special guest of honor, President Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency, Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu, Grand Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic, we want to take a synoptic look at the history behind the Change of Guard Parade that we're going to witness today. Now, the Change of Guard ceremony dates back to the colonial era when the British colonial masters introduced uh, the ceremony as an avenue to demonstrate the reliability and preparedness of their soldiers. Now, the ceremony then involved uh, the former relief of the old colonial guard by the new set symbolizing the seamless transition of duties and responsibilities. At Nigeria's independence on 1st October 1960, the routine change of guard between the old and new colonial guards was replaced uh, by the change of guard between the old British guard, colonial guard and the new Nigerian Armed Forces Guard. And since then, the change of guard parade remained a routine parade between the old and the new security guards at the presidential villa. Uh, Abuja, this institu institutionalizing professionalism in the Nigerian army. To an appreciable extent, the troops are highly trained, very well equipped, disciplined, and highly motivated towards achieving uh, the constitutional role and responsibilities. Now, the change of guard ceremony routinely takes place at military inst installations, national landmarks, and official events. It involves a meticulously choreographed drill performed by soldiers of the Nigerian Armed Forces and usually attracts the attention of spectators and officials alike. The change of guard parade is known for its precision, discipline, and attention to details. It showcases the training, skills, and military bearing of the personnel participating in the ceremony. Above all, the parade and the actual change of the guards are designed to create rest and relief for troops on security duty. The importance of rest and relief during military operations cannot be overemphasized as both factors are prerequisites for force effectiveness and efficiency. End of that synoptic look of the history behind Change of Guards Parade. Ban, some more musical interlude, please. Well, respect the arrival of the special guest of honor, Ban. Thank you. Thank you. 
entertaining, redemic, thank you. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Your Excellencies, former President, former Vice President here present, the distinguished Senate President, the Right Honourable Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Lordship, the Chief Justice, distinguished Honourable Members of the National Assembly here present, Honourable Members of the Federal Executive Council, the Chief of Defense Staff, Service Chiefs, Inspector General of Police, very senior military officers, both serving and disabled retired. Your Royal Highnesses, my Lord Spiritual and Temporal, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. We can hear from the arena of the quarter guard some orders there. Indicating that any moment from now, the special guest of honor, present commander in chief of our great nation, Nigeria, will be entering the arena presidentially. That is, it is the abridged version of the weekly presidential change of guard parade holding here at the four courts of the president of Villa Abuja where ceremonies commemorating the 63rd, 63 independence anniversary is taking place. The bagel is quite loud, sound, and uh, tells us that uh, the special guest of honor will be entering the arena any moment from now. Please, when we announce his arrival, in absolute deference to his most exalted offices and his very distinguished personal. We are pleased expect to rise wherever we are sitting. Officers, for answers, and you please salute, please. This is announcing the arrival of the special guest of honor, President Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Grand Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic, 
just been received there by the Commander Guards Brigade. We can see the presidential limousine being uh, sandwiched there by the bagpipers. The occasion is very unique. The 63rd Independence Anniversary of our great nation, Nigeria, holding here at the forecourt of the President Villa. Highly dignified. Highly dignified. Thank you. Please kindly rise on your feet wherever you are sitting. And when the national salute is rendered, officers, warrant officers in uniform should please salute. Thank you. Rise on your feet, officers. Warrant officers in your front, you please salute. Thank you. salute and heralded the arrival of the special guest of honor present commander-in-chief over the parade commander lieutenant colonel Emmy yusuf now marches towards the position of mr president to give him the essence of today's ceremony the officers and guards on parade we hear that shortly Very 
distinctly delivered there by the parade commander, the Chairman Colonel Ebe Yusuf, and has been presidential given the permission to carry with the rest of the parade. Happy being your excellent. Excellency, the special guest of honor, standing on existing protocol, we have two guards on parade. The guard ahead of the color party symbolizes the outgoing colonial guards who got off our nation 63 years ago symbolically being represented in this parade by an officer from the Nigerian Navy and personnel from the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Air Force and the Nigerian Police. And the guard behind the color party is the incoming, the incoming Nigerian guard made up of officer and personnel of the Nigerian Army. Now, once again, we have four colors on parade. This is quite historic. Weekly presidential change of guards, the forecourt has always been two colors on parade, namely the national color for British nation Nigeria and the regimental color of the Nigerian army. But today we have four colors on parade, the national color and the regimental colors of the Nigerian army, the Nigerian Navy and the Nigerian Air Force. We must say that now the essence, the essence of the inspection of guards, both the quarter guard and the guards, is to ensure, to ensure their forerunners, either in person or whatever they are putting on from their boots to their uniform to their hairdo, and indeed, everything about them because that is the that's the the, the the reflection of any nation for instance any visitor to the presidency say high commissioners uh members of uh, the diplomatic corps and all will go through the quarter guard inspect the quarter guard and the impression that is taken from this is for all times shortly uh, the old guard commander and the new guard commander will inspect the guards and of course uh, including the guards and as a, the quarter guard. Now at this juncture the microphone will swing over to my co-announcer Lieutenant Odumayo Bilkisu Olokodano, Olokodano please. Thank you. Thank you, Major Paula Retired. Your Excellencies, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
today ceremony is an abbreviation of the weekly change of God, and this is the special presidential change of God. And of course, as the name implies, is the exchange of God that was on ground with another God. On parade also is the highly revered component of regimentation, the color party which comprises of the ensigns, escort to the colors, and the parade regiment as the majors. As earlier mentioned, there are four colors on parade, national and regimental color of the Nigerian Army, Navy, Air Force, and Parade. Lieutenant Colonel Moshid Abiyadi Yusuf just marching the two guards and is now marching to take his position at the right side of the road guard. The two guards are provided by the Nigerian Armed Forces and the Nigerian Police Force. To the right of Mr. President's sitting position is new guard, while the on the left is old guard. The old guard represents the British Army before Nigerian gained independence in 1960. Why the new guy represents what we know today as Nigerian army after independence. Waiting the company sergeant major warrant of Sir Idoma Patrick to take post behind the old guard. Any moment from now, the new guard commander will take post. Commander Major Jabir Ma Isa marching there alongside with the company Sergeant Major. Warrant of Sir Kefas Imos. See this discipline, training, and courage what you see there and is of course to inspect the incoming security guard and the cutter guard. We will see that shortly.
in Kong. A security guard is an allied security guard tasked with the protection of Mr. President, the first family, and protection of the seat of power. Inspection of security guard during the change of guard parade is carried out to ensure that the incoming guard is composed of discipline when turned out and complete soldiers on parade. It equally affords the new guard commanders the opportunity of having personal contact with the soldiers resuming duty with him as he expects the guards. The inspection is usually done together with the company sergeant major as you can see. The company sergeant major sees to the implementation of instruction from the guard commander as it relates to the discipline, conduct and administration of the troops throughout the duration of the duty. Just finished inspecting the front, first round, now moving to the center round. You may be wondering why is the new guard commander looking down and looking up. He's looking down to ensure their boot is well shown and looking up to ensure their uniform is well iron and clean as it is expected for all personnel of Nigerian forces and Nigerian police force to turn out neatly at all times, especially while on duty or on parade. Now the new guard commander is marching forward to inspect the weapon of the incoming quarter guard. in preparation for their duties. This set of inspection involved the conduct of the normal safety precaution to ensure that the personnel weapons are clean, safe and in serviceable conditions. The cutter guard is always the first point of contact in every unit, and it is believed that the impression about a unit cutter guard has a direct bearing on the overall impression of the entire unit. Hence, the need for turning out a composed, alert, and professional cutter guard at all times. The inspection of the cutter guard, just like the security guard, is carried. 
without to ensure that the incoming contact guy is composed of discipline, well turned out, and complete soldiers. The new guard commander just finished inspecting their weapon to ensure it is clean, safe, and in serviceable condition. Number five rifle man, who is the best turnout soldiers among the Kotaga private soldiers, is selected as a stick oddly to the new guard commander and is expected to be in attendance to the new guard commander throughout the tour of his duty. He will accompany the commander wherever he goes, unless specifically ordered not to do so. Commander has just granted the Hodley Sergeant, Hodley Corporal, and Cotagastic Hodley to fall out in order to quickly prepare the duty details of the security guard before the end of the parade to enable individual soldiers to know the duty location and the act to move over and secure throughout the tour of duty of the guard. Kotaga sergeant and duty bigler taking post in front and rear of the incoming Kotaga. The Kotaga sergeant matches the incoming Kotaga to take over duty from the outgoing Kotaga. Next on our program will be Joint Color Patrol by the Nigerian Armed Forces. Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, permit me to hand over the microphone to Major Paula Barra, retired to continue with the proceedings. Major Paula Barra, sir. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Obio Lokodano. Your Excellency, standing on existing protocol, we just witnessed a while ago incisive, incisive inspection of the soldiers that were taken over at the quarter guard as symbolically the British colonial soldiers are parting from our great nation Nigeria. We did say a while ago that the impression that is created at the quarter guard is carried on for a while because you, you get the impression of turnout and of course the Nigerian army is not an exception, particularly the Presidential Guards Brigade 
and of course uh, the battalion under the brigade. Excellent turnout any day, anywhere, anytime. Your Excellency, special guest of honor, still standing on existing protocol. Next will be the color patrol. We can see four officers with colors on their shoulder. We are going to meet the officers shortly, but color patrol, the importance in an occasion of this magnitude, will take a synoptic look. Now, the history and the significance of color patrol in the Nigerian army. At independence on 1st October 1960, the Nigerian national color and the services colors were first paraded in a symbolic and prestigious military parade known as the color patrol, symbolizing the unity and pride of the military as well as the now, since then, the National Corps and the Services Regimental Corps have replaced the British Corps during ceremonial parades. These Corps are consecrated and blessed to instill spiritual significance and reinforce the commitment and solemnity of the rule they represent. Ordinarily, the Corps are marched on parade during regimental and the national parades. In this parade, the colors forming a color party match as a component of the parade. However, during change of guard parades, such as handing and taking over parades, inaugural inauguration parades, and special parades like we are witnessing today, color patrols are conducted to signify the end of a, of a duty tour and the beginning of another. Now, the color patrol is usually made up of a select set of officers who are chosen based on their discipline and military bearing. They undergo special training to ensure precision, uniformity, and ceremonial excellence. Those movements of foot and arms rail are highly calculated, mercurial, if you will, computerized, they presented presence of mind and compulsive call to duty. Overall, the color patrol in the Nigerian army serves as a visible symbol of national and military pride, honor, and tradition. It reinforces the importance of the Nigerian army's role in protecting the nation and upholding its values, while also showcasing the country's military heritage and identity. Now, the land signs conducting the color patrol are a component of the color party. The other component of the party is the escort. Now, the escort of the colors usually is composed of armed soldiers, ratings and airmen as well as regimental sergeant majors, commonly known as uh, RSFs, from the various services. Now the ensigns, as we witnessed a few minutes ago, broke out from the uh, color party, leaving behind the escorts. Patrol is often done by Gas Brigade during weekly change of gas parade at the presidential villa and the national arcade. However, this is the first of its kind in which the armed forces of Nigeria is having a combined services color patrol, which includes the Nigerian Army, the Nigerian Navy, and the Nigerian Air Force, respectively. This is indeed a unique innovation that was introduced in this historic. Nigeria 63rd Independence Anniversary by the Commander Guards Brigade Colonel Adebisi Olusegun Onosoya. May I please at this juncture very, very diligently and 
respectfully request the special guest of honor and all dignitaries to please rise in honor of these colors, please. All to rise, please. Officers, warrants of St. George, please salute, please. Thank you. Excellent performance 